Todd and Krista Kolstad are Montana parents who have lost custody of their 14-year-old daughter because they refused. 14-year-old teen who goes by he, him, but they go, they call him a she. So it's assigned female at birth, identifies as male. So they're misgendering the teenager from the start, right? Used to affirm her new declaration that she is a boy. They are here today to tell us their story. And then after, you'll want to stick around because I have lots of commentary, analysis, and some lessons I think that we can draw from their story. Without further ado, here are the Kolstads. Kolstads, thank you so much for taking the time to join us. Uh, so a lot of people have seen your story circulating on social media that you guys are saying that the state of Montana has basically kidnapped your child correct because you guys wouldn't affirm her uh declaration that she is okay first of all the mom got a goth spirit how could a mom with a goth spirit not be pro-trans first of all i just feel like goth and trans i mean talk about subcultures okay so already i'm going into this uh i just feel like she's a goth queen internally you know the opposite gender correct Yes. So take us back. Tell us um, how this started. Did you first start to observe your daughter's... Yeah, literally Edna Mode. Literally goth queen. ...desire to present as a, a boy yourself? Was this something that you noticed in her social life? Not really. She had, um, at, at church, she had told some people that she wanted to be called Leo and he him. And so it was brought to our attention through the church. Okay, so some Okay, so Leo, he, him, but they're misgendering their kid as she, her. Someone uh, like a youth minister or a leader at your church said, hey, just FYI, this is happening. Right. And so at that point, and this was this was quite a while. <laughs> the bangs say turf, though. Damn, you're so right, though. The bangs do say turf. A while ago, um... This was what a year and a half ago about a year and a half ago or so um and so at that point we had a discussion with her about you know why do you feel this way could you feel this way because there, maybe there's some past issues in your life that you're trying to resolve which is normal everybody has that and it's important to note that she's what does everybody have past issues they need to resolve in their what been in counseling off and on um throughout her young life erica says question how do we no, if the child is seeking attention versus actually really transgender, can a teen be confused? Mm, it doesn't matter, right? Does it make a difference in the argument about seeking attention or not? Like, does it change the journey of a teenager, right? Uh, whether or not they're like seeking attention or not? Like, you know what I mean? Does it actually matter? You know what I mean? If they want to be... I don't know how much that changes, you know what I mean? Like misgendering your teen, whether they want attention or not, I, you know what I mean? Like, does that matter? And so we decided, well, let's go back to counseling and let's discuss this with a counselor and have them help you through this stage. Okay. So, and your daughter is 14 now. Mm -hmm. yes. And how old was she when you were told by someone at the church that she... I just think it's funny that all the people so far are misgendering their kid, even though the kids said they want to be called Leo and they're he, him. And they're like, why does my teenager fucking not want to live in my house? <laughs> Bro, growing up as a queer kid who has borderline personality disorder because I grew up in a conservative home, even though I love my parents and I've gone to therapy and I understand their perspective is their own, it was still hell on earth living in a home that gaslit you. And by the way, now that I'm even in my 30s, my parents still do the same thing because they don't believe in LGBT people. So I always have to remind them three of their kids are queer and it is what it is. And like your grandkids, what about my like, what about their grandkids going on this journey? Right. So again, like, I just love that they're like, why does my teenager want to live at home with me? Well, maybe because you literally are misgendering them over and over again for no reason, except you will never validate their existence. So like, what's happening here? She was asking people to call her Leo. She was um, late 12, almost 13. So it was about a year and a half ago. Okay. Wow. And I just, I imagine that was really difficult to come to terms with, that these were feelings that she was having. I mean... Uh, what was your reaction at the time? 
Um, we we were also receiving text messages from people in town saying the same thing that uh, she was doing that, but our reaction was to ask her about it, and right. um, she kind of played it down like it wasn't a you big know, deal. Yeah, we were shocked, but she really downplayed it. Like, no, 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 that's not really a, a big deal mm. to me. You know, I just like doing stuff like that. So she she didn't come to us hardcore and say, this is what I'm doing, right. this is what I want to do. She really downplayed it. And if you're, which is pretty normal, right? So my mom recently was like, and by recently, I mean like a year or two ago or whatever. She was like, I would have known if you were into girls growing up, Brittany, you would have told me. You always told me everything. And I was like, yeah, but I'm not going to tell my conservative parents that I like girls. That's the one thing I know not to tell you. Your parents teach you to be the greatest liars. I always tell my parents, you made your children into beautiful liars. Like we're so good at lying as a family because you taught us that it's better to lie than to tell you the truth because of the consequence of telling the truth, right? And look, everyone goes on a journey. It doesn't matter if you think you're trans and you're not. It doesn't matter if you think you're straight and you're not. Everyone's going to go through a journey of like being like, is this who I am? Is this who I am? And the point of it is to let someone go through the journey and have it be what it ends up being. It is what it is, right? I don't think transitioners should regret things. I don't think you should go to college and regret things. I don't think you should get married and regret things. Like you can regret if you want, but don't let your whole life be swallowed up by that regret. It's just part of your journey. Mikey with the super chat, do you think your farm brother would react well to having LGBT uh, LGBT child or does he hold his religious values to the same standard as Yarl's parents? So I've talked to my farm brother about this before. My farm brother is more interested in breaking generational curses. So of course, if the kids end up being gay or trans, he wouldn't be able to reaffirm them while they live at home, but he would explain to them that from a Catholic persp perspective, he can't. And then as their father, though he understands they might be different and would allow them that difference, you know, while they're in the home, it would be much harder for him to reaffirm that in them. So like, you know, he could, they could talk to me, they could talk to somebody else. Like realistically, if his kids end up being LGBT of any kind, they're going to talk to me because, or they're going to have a question about their own religion, right? Like, do they stay Catholic and, you know, not engage in LGBT, uh, I guess like relationships, do they not transition? It's going to be up to the individual trial to decide, but my brother is not going to stop them. Like in a sense, like he's not going to, uh, not like, you know what I mean? Like we've already talked about this from my understanding. He's not going to stop them. Like he's not going to do to them what my parents did to me and my brother and my, my sister. Like he's not going to be, he's going to let them decide, but let them also know that, hey, as a Catholic, like I can't support this, but also like you get to do what you want with your life type thing. You know what I mean? So from my understanding, it's going to be much better for his kids than it ever was for my parents' kids. And again, I love my parents. I have a good relationship with my parents. Uh, but they do take their religion pretty fucking seriously, which somebody pointed out to me in the comment section. They said, Brittany, I come from a similar background than you, where there's little hypocrisy in our family because they are religious. But a lot of people are used to religious parents who are very, very um, hypocritical and my parents aren't like that. If they think it's wrong, they're just not gonna, like they don't go to anyone's weddings. Like they didn't just not come to my wedding. They don't go to their friends' weddings. My brother doesn't go to other people's weddings, even some of his best friends. He doesn't go to their weddings because it's like not a part of their religion. So it's not that they rejected me personally. They literally have the same rules for everybody. And so they're very values, you know, oriented. And so I think that's also something that I, I can accept a lot easier than a hip, like if my parents were hypocritical, it'd be different. But because they just like, this is just how they are, I'm like, oh, okay. Like it hurts as a person. It's like, oh, I want you at my wedding. But then as like a like a rational person, I can understand like different bubbles have different rules. You know what I mean? You're able to say, you said that she was in counseling throughout her young life. Um, can you say what she was in counseling for? Is it related at all to gender mm. confusion or no? No, she... She's really struggled with bullying um, since about, gosh, maybe third grade. Well, that's a red flag. Your kid's been struggling with bullying since third fucking grade? It's about third grade. She's struggled yeah. with bullying mm. and yeah. issues around that. Yeah. Yeah. Gosh, that's so that's so tough to deal with. So she's been in therapy or counseling uh, because of that, just feeling excluded and I'm sure self-esteem and, and other things like that, right? Correct. So that, as you know, that would lend to self-esteem, self-worth, and how you feel about yourself. 
And, um, you know, she's always just really, really struggled with fitting in at school and she wants so bad to fit in, but she's just, she's a great kid, super, yeah. super smart. They're basically describing every, like, is she neurodivergent? Is she queer? Is she trans? Like, why isn't she fitting in? Well, maybe because he's a he. That's the thing is the kid feels like they're a he. They say it's a she. Oh, this is going to get confusing with gendering stuff. How do we have this conversation? The child? The teenager? I don't know how to have the conversation because the gendering is off. So they're misgendering their kid who is assigned female at birth but identifies as a male. And the judge took the kid away because the parents weren't going to reaffirm the gender and we're going to tell them, if anything, it's a mental health issue and you're going to have to fix this, right? But then they've been bullied since third grade and they've always stood out and they've never gone along with people. So why is that? Like, don't, doesn't that even, isn't that even more of a case that they're probably trans or more of a case that they're probably, you know what I mean? Not like everyone else's kids. But she's the kid that's always been in math club and not like the cheerleader type. Right. Yeah, she's done right. very well in school, self-taught herself, guitar. She's just a very intelligent little girl. Yeah. Bro, this would trigger the fuck out of me if I was a trans kid in a family that kept misgendering me and then telling me they love me. It is very triggering. Even as a queer kid, it is extremely triggering to be around parents that are like, you're not really gay, you're not really gay, you're not really gay, you're not. So I, again, like peace and love to my family. But like even that's why I have such strong boundaries with people I love because I know they mean well, but like it's you believe in an invisible God and I'm experiencing a personal relationship with my gender. You know what I mean? Ingrid said, sounds like he might be autistic. I wonder if the kid is autistic. I and I know you guys think I think everyone is autistic and that's the big joke, but already they're describing a kid who's probably neurodivergent and neurodivergency and like gender have a very complicated relationship. You know what I mean? He likes math, not cheerleading. Oh, my God, who cares? Well, I'm just saying, you know, when they brought that up, I'm like, oh, that's like maybe they are more in their masculine or maybe they are more interested. You know what I mean? So this. Mm. And, you know, this is actually a common thread that I see a lot when you have a child who says that they are confused about their gender or who says that they are the opposite sex. A lot of times these factors are at play. They're exceptional in a lot of ways. Maybe they don't fit into the mainstream at school. And so um, as you guys pointed out when you kind of confronted her about this, uh, it could be... Con they also don't look mainstream. The parents, the mom, the mom looks alternative. The mom looks something weird. She looks weird. This purple, her hair is definitely not a normal color unless it's the lighting. Guys, her hair is definitely like a purplish color or like a reddish, blackish purple. Like she's got the weird goth. Go There's no way this mom was not a little bit of a freak in the sheets or something. I'm telling you. Connected to some other things that had happened to her life or feelings that she had had. Do you know if she had uh, connected to any kind of community online that would have made her believe that, hey, maybe you don't fit in because you are really a boy? <laughs> she did. So <laughs> Ingrid says the mom is deaf a turf. <laughs> Definitely a turf. Oh, they got turf energy. They both got that neurodivergent stare. Bro, bro, stop. <laughs> Honestly, it's so interesting. It is so interesting. But already, conservatives do this. Everybody does this. Everyone thinks like, oh, the only reason you think that is because you went down the like the pipeline of propaganda. Oh, the only way, the only reason you think this is because you saw something that made you think this. Look, that's everybody. Most of us only think things because we see it and think that sounds true. I saw a TikTok that said, oh, man, I've turned into my parents who believe everything they see on Facebook reels. I believe everything I see on TikTok. We're all just believing what we see. That's why it's so important to recognize like what you're consuming because it absolutely impacts your narrative. So the idea that conservatives are still forgetting that they are also consuming a narrative is something that I will always find amazing about Bubbles. It's like, we'll all say the word bubble. We'll know we live in a bubble. We'll know other people live in a bubble, but they'll never know they live in the bubble. They'll never think like, oh, maybe I live in the bubble. Of course you live in the bubble. We all live in the bubble. Conservatives, literally, I can always tell who people are listening to by like, oh, you must be listening to so-and-so because this is how they talk. Oh, I know who you've been listening to. You sound just like so-and-so. It's like, how do they not understand? Like, hello, some... Everyone goes down a pipeline. Everyone is influenced by what they consume, even conservatives. Whether the kid turned out trans or Christian or Muslim or Jewish or whatever, that is probably an, a combination of being influenced by something. What about Kavon D? 
what if I was like Kat Von D's been influenced? She must have been on a Christian website. I can't believe. Yeah, I'm shocked Chris, she turned it into a Christian. But also celebrate her choice. This white lady, this one here, this host, she interviewed Kat Von D. I'm sure she didn't ask Kat Von D, were you on some Christian websites that led you down this path? As long as it heads towards your path, the path you like, people are happy for you. If you go down a path they don't like, they're not happy for you. And to be honest with you, I think we all struggle with this. Sometimes I look at my friends and I'm like, why'd you make that decision? But also like you do you, you know what I mean? Um, Lesky says, how do you explain why LGBT people existed uh, before it was more culturally accepted? Like if people are LGBT because of the propaganda, how do you, uh, history by his, or how do you, okay, why are they still in history? I'll tell you. In my bubble, they would say gay people are a result of sin, molestation, predatory behavior, um, a, a rejection of God, um, what else? Uh, so on and so forth. It's like they would say something like that. Like, you know what I mean? We, we use an app, I believe it's called Custodio. Um, to limit her where she's allowed to go on the internet with her computer and her phone and to limit who she can talk to and stuff like that. But she she's super, super smart and she found a loophole. And then I found out that mm. she was on Reddit in these transgender communities talking to, cesspool Reddit. to other people. Mm. You know, this is, gosh, I've had a lot of detransitioners actually on my show and that is something that we hear so much. Yes, every, a detransitioner is just as valid as a transitioned person or a trans person. Detransitioners are just as valid in their experience, but them existing does not eradicate the reality that trans people exist. And that's the thing everyone has to understand. And same for the people that think like detransitioners like aren't valid and stuff. Like your journey of your own gender is valid, bro. But if you say like what happened to you is what's going to happen to other people, I think you're making a mistake. Like one of the most prominent porn um, actresses, I forget what her name is. She ended up dedicating her life to being anti-porn because she had a horrible experience. Again, just because it happened to you doesn't mean it's going to happen to other people. But let's talk about the nuance of that. Is there a way to be trans without it being harmful? Is there a way to be a detransitioner without it being harmful? And yeah, I would say, of course there is. I mean, gosh, with the with the numbers of like mental health issues and religions, you would think that we'd start questioning religion. But most people don't have that conversation either. Everyone goes on a journey. Watch Tumblr and Reddit. And it's typically a kid who is, um, you know, had a trouble fitting in at school. And, you know, all of us at, at one point went through different things like that. But today it's different because then you can go online and you can talk to strangers who then tell you lies about yourself that, oh, you don't fit in because you're really a boy or you're really this. And of course, for any 12 year old, that's going to cause a lot of distress and confusion. Right. Right. Yeah. And so she finally, you know, found a community where she was uh, liked and, and right. they were telling her how great and how important she was. Unfortunately, it's a community that was preying on her. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Without a doubt. Yeah. Gosh, that is just a commonality in all of these stories. Okay. So, but you did the, you know, you did the thing that parents, that all good parents would. You went to her and you talked to her and then you said, okay, we've got to go to counseling and we've got to figure this out. You didn't say, okay, yeah, you're a boy. Let's just go along with this and call you a new name. No, we, we realize, I mean, we're not naive and we realize that we, we've had a, a teen on our, on our hands that's got some issues and we were helping to work through those issues the best we could via counseling and, and things like that. So we weren't um, turning a blind eye to it or anything. We acknowledged that she felt that way and we explained why, you know, we didn't agree with it and it's not something we were okay with. And um, we agreed. So that you didn't understand why she felt that way. Well, he felt that way. Counseling would be a good a good start to work this out. That's the dilemma. You can't say, I understand where you're coming from, but it's not real. I'm never going to accept it. Well, then you don't understand it. You cannot understand a trans person's experience and then say it's not real. Now, if you think that your kid isn't trans, then you still should understand the experience, which you don't, by the way of possibly thinking you're trans. And I think like a few of my siblings have asked themselves is that like all my siblings and I are very open about like, what are we? What's our orientations? What's our gender? What's this stuff? These parents have already decided no matter what their kid says, they're not budging. That's why, you know, again, I get this feedback from people and I think it's really sweet where people assume that just because I get along with my parents, it means like when I go home, they're not being anti-LGBT. Nope, they're still being just as anti-LGBT. 
I just have a better attitude about it because I am practicing my wise mind. <laughs> and also like I let go of the attachment of wanting them to be different than the person that they are. So it's not like I don't go home and my brother doesn't go home and my sister doesn't go home and my parents aren't constantly saying that progressives are ruining the world and like gay people and LGBT people are like ruining the sanctity of blah, 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 blah. No, of course I hear that all the time. And then I go past, past the chicken and I go, uh-huh, yep, them freaking gays, am I right? Like we just, mm-hmm. Especially when it comes to trans people. I remember I wrote a blog like 12 years ago about trans people. My dad, my dad used to read my blog and he'd be like, Betty, why are you talking about trans people? And I was like, I don't understand how you don't think this is insanely interesting that people don't feel like the right gender in their bodies. And he was like, I don't understand why you think this isn't like a, a mental health issue. And I was like, well, I think it's, I could think it could be both, but also maybe it's neither. Like maybe we haven't even started to think about what it could be. And that like started the journey of my parents realizing like, oh, like our daughter's pro LGBT and pro trans and she's coming out herself and like all these things started to happen. And then my siblings came out who were younger. And of course, Brittany's the reason they're gay because like she was the influence. Obviously, that takes away the agency of my siblings. My siblings are like, hey, Brittany's not the reason I'm gay. She's not that cool. But that's the problem. Parents refuse to believe if they've already made a decision on the outcome that there could be any other reason. And that's just what it is. Right. So with like peace and love to these parents, I'm sure they really love their kid. But they're not going to have a relationship with their kid in the future if they keep fucking misgendering them. They're not acknowledging their journey. And especially not if the kid doesn't decide, like if the kid decides they're cis after all. Okay, because it's a journey. The if the parents do the, I told you so, I knew you better than you knew yourself, like you're not going to see your kid. And look, I know, and I tell you this all the time, I think it is a sign of dysfunction if you don't have a relationship with your parents. Wouldn't you say this is dysfunctional? I would say it is dysfunctional to misgender your child. I would also say it's dysfunctional to say I want to help my child by ignoring every one of their like requests and needs. And I would say it shows you have a dysfunctional relationship with your parents because you cannot talk to them. And I wouldn't, I'm not blaming you, but I am calling it dysfunctional, which is why, again, I say if you want to have a functional relationship with life and with your parents and with yourself, sometimes it starts with dysfunction and leads to functionality. Right. So again, like I'm going to call this dysfunctional. I'm going to say the trans kid is probably dysfunctional and I'm going to say eventually they won't be because you can move out of that. But I think we're all kind of dysfunctional on a spectrum. Sometimes I'm dysfunctional. Sometimes I'm functional. You know, um, Wolf says the parents are indoctrinated, closed minded, mentally ill. If you ask me too much religion, a.k.a. delusional nonsense. Well, that's one of the dilemmas, too, as we're living in a world where people say, value and respect us for believing in an invisible God, but we're not going to believe in your invisible gender. It's like, can we just have both? You get to worship your God. They get to have a gender, you know, but no, that's not good enough. And that's what's so beautiful is they'll talk about what reality is. Religious people, God bless them, will literally try to say, I know what reality is. And I'm like, ma'am, you were literally talking to a statue. Ma'am, you were praying to the con like the voice in your own head. Like, ma'am, you were eating a piece of bread got it that was manufactured in some like, you know, warehouse and like calling it the actual body of Christ. Like, ma'am. And again, with peace and love, I love that for you. But it's so interesting that they get to believe in an invisible God, but you can't believe in a gender. Okay, cool. I love that. You know, uh, Bezos says it can be mental health, but not always like uh, is being Christian a mental illness because you believe in something unprovable. I don't think so. But also gender dysphoria sounds so distressing. Yeah, I think it could be both things, too. Obviously, all trans people aren't a monolith. So individual trans people are going to have a different experience and individual religious people are going to have a different experience. You know what I mean? And, yeah, and this, this oh, wasn't a daily problem that we're dealing with every single day. It was very rare, like um, years apart. <laughs> so. Right, right. So you guys didn't really get the indication from how she was dressing or how she was acting that this was really like a persistent distressing feeling that she was having, that she was a boy. Correct. So regarding her clothes, because people have asked us, we've always allowed her pick out her own clothes. And the way that we've done that is we let her put the clothes in the Amazon cart and then we look at them and say, is, is that an OK shirt or no, nah, yeah. you, you shouldn't have that. And then we'll buy them for her. So oh. she's always been a jeans and T-shirt kid. She's never been into dresses and fancy shoes or anything.
I mean, we've either got a butch lesbian on our hands, a bisexual, pansexual tomboy, or we got a trans man on our hands. Trans boy. I'm. I'm. Mean, she's just a normal tomboy kid. Yeah. Yeah. And you know what? I was I was the exact same way. And in some ways, I'm thankful that I grew up in the 90s and early 2000s to where you could just do that. And you can do that. You can do that. You can be a tomboy. You can do that. Yep. You can. That's still a thing. Didn't go away. No one uh, questioned anything. But gosh, it's a it's a lot harder for kids who don't conform to, um, uh -huh. you know, the, the the mainstream acceptable standards for. I love these know, people. I love these people because they're like, we need to make kids or make make sure kids aren't freaks. And we, we want them to be the mainstream which is what's normal. And then your kid is in the mainstream and they're like, that's totally normal. Guys, everything your kid does is probably totally normal. Normal is just like saying like expecta expectation of behavior, but also like it could mean also so many things. Like being a tomboy is so literally a thing. You can do it if you want. Okay. It doesn't mean you're trans. And it also doesn't mean that trans people see tomboys and think you're trans. Right? That's not a thing that happens. I mean, if you're kids, I mean, it's not a thing that generally happens. You know what I mean? Um, but people hope for it. Bro, every time I talk to my parents, I am in my mid-30s. My partner and I are in a, our literal 30s. We have lived three decades on this planet. And my parents, literally every time they talk or call me, are like, I can't wait for you guys to join the Catholic Church. What if every time I called my parents, I was like, I can't wait till you're pro-LGBT. I love you. Tell me that wouldn't be annoying. Tell me they wouldn't get the fuck triggered. They would get the fuck triggered. I should start doing that just for fun. They would get the fuck triggered, bro. If I called my mom and every time I talked to her, I was like, I can't wait for you to be LG pro LGBT. I'm so looking forward to it. I just think it would be so lovely. She told me she had a premonition. My mom goes, I have a premonition. You and your husband are going to be walking down the streets of Croatia. You're going to see a church. It's going to be a Sunday. <gasps> Then you're going to walk into the church and you're going to feel the Holy Spirit come over you. And you're going to say, you're looking up to the sky to God like, are you real? And he's going to say, yes, Brittany, I'm real. Yes, Brittany, I'm real. And I was like, uh-huh. And I just look at my mom and I go, I love you so much, mom. And she goes, I know, Betty. I can't wait, Betty. I love you so I can't wait. And I was like, I love you. Yeah. I love my mom. I love my parents. They're the nicest, sweetest people. Holy shit, though, the emotional labor I do for my parents just to like, OK, yeah. Yeah, I love you. I know. I get it. You know what I mean? I girl, girl, wear and things like that. So I understand that that was probably really difficult. OK, so um, that was when she was about 12 and you and before I kind of fast forward to how everything has unfolded now, um, you did mention that. You guys go to church, and so you're Christians, and I'm sure that has something to do with this is a Christian show. I'm sure that has something to do with your opposition to a child identifying as the opposite sex. Now, at church, uh, you said that a church leader came to you and said she's asking people to call her Leo. Were there people in the church kind of affirming this idea that she was a yes. boy? Multiple people were um, confronting us about it. Some of them were flat out saying we met your son at church today. But they wow. were. Oh, OK. That's kind of nice that people are reaffirming his gender in church. Thomas says, I think it's kind of naive to say no one assumes queer when seeing a tomboy. Many people do. Um, I said trans, not like queer, but trans. I'm saying, of course, it happens. But I'm saying no more than anything else happens. They're making it sound like it's more than normal. I think it's very normal for I look at people and think autism all the time or neurodivergency or queer all the time. But I'm saying everyone does this. I'm just making the argument that it's not unique. So when people conservative parents go, oh, it's very different. The trans people like tell you they like tell you you must be trans. Oh, you must be trans. Everyone does this with everything. Everyone tells their friends, oh, this must mean this about you. You must be this about you. Oh, this must mean I'm just saying it's not. You know, OK, wait, wait, wait. For those of you saying my mom is delusional, I need you know, I need you to know this is very typical. Uh, my Muslim friends are similar. Oh, I can't wait for you, Brittany, to like realize how beautiful like Islam is or like my brother is like, oh, I can't wait for you to like realize like it's very normal. I've heard it my whole life from like religious people. My whole life, I've never had a religious person not wish 
one day that I would be their religion. So to be fair to my mother, it is very normal in my bubble to hear that from everybody growing up. I've heard it from so many people my whole life. Like, you know, you would make a wonderful blah, blah, blah. Oh my God, Brittany, you would just be such a great church leader. Oh, Brittany, like, I can't wait for you to find Jesus Christ. Like, I can't wait for you. And I'm like, thank you. I know you want me a part of your team, but I already bat for the rainbow. So I'm busy, you know? Really affirming her. I think people were kind of like, what do we do with this? Like, you know, this kid is saying this and and how do you even nobody really knows how to approach it it's so new and especially in the yeah. little area that we are in so no they were not um going behind our backs and affirming okay. or anything like that no the church was fantastic so hmm. the, the counselors there the faculty all of them were wow ingrid really my mom still thinks i'll go to lutheran church i didn't know that about your parents that's so interesting or about your mom just great so okay so they were just more confused about about what was happening, but she was maybe uh-huh. using their confusion as a form of affirmation for her, trying to get them to call her Leah. Hmm. Yes. Okay, let's fast forward then, because you... Ian says, so religious people don't have the capacity, capability to question their own beliefs? Not often, and I would say most people don't. I would say most of the planet does not have, does not engage in the capability. That's what my work is predicated on. We all live in bubbles. A lot of us die in bubbles. People hardly question anything about their life. That's why it's such a big deal to have a midlife crisis. Guys, they dedicate whole movies and shows to like a midlife. Why would you have a midlife crisis? What is the midlife crisis? The midlife crisis is a pattern of human behavior of people not questioning anything about their life until they reach a midlife. Then they go, oh my God, wait, wait, what's happening? I don't even I don't even know why I would have a midlife crisis. Like why would I have one of those? You know what I mean? We all have crises in our I think I had a 20s crisis, honestly. I think I had my midlife crisis in my 20s. But, you know, that feeling comes from not asking yourself every day, every week, not checking in with yourself. And plus, if you dismantle um to think about Rhett and Link, right? And Link have talked about this a lot. It is a very big deal to question your religious belief because it changes all the relationships you're going to have with people. So remember, like, it's it's very much not encouraged to, like, leave religion. It's, it's encouraged to go deeper into religion for that reason. So, you know, secular people have this problem too, but religious people particularly are encouraged, obviously, to challenge themselves, to question their faith, only to become stronger and come back into it, right? So I, I think that, yeah. You said that this wasn't a daily thing that was happening. You got her counseling. I'm sure that at one point, maybe you thought that you worked through it. But what has happened recently that you have lost custody of your little girl? Right. God, every so time on, they misgender um, him, August I get... 18. Every time they misgender him, I get annoyed. Like I do in my brain, like goes... And I'm like, this is why your kid isn't with you anymore. Like they're so lacking introspect. Like they cannot... F- extrospection. They cannot think that they have contributed in any way to this happening i'm amazed at them like look i'm middle eastern i come from an immigrant background we don't get the authorities involved that's kind of the rules like i don't want to call the cops or get them involved you know what i mean but just a reminder that i did take in my minor brother uh in seattle right i think my biggest regret with my brother was like sending him back home at all um you know what i mean i think that is my biggest regret with my brother but he did live with me for some time and I would take him to high school. My parents didn't call the authorities, obviously, because like we don't get people involved. But he couldn't be in that house anymore. Like he couldn't be around the homophobia anymore. It's too much, guys. It's too much. It's You don't understand you're torturing your child. You are literally torturing the thing you say you love. The person you say you love, you are literally torturing them. You think you love them. You are literally driving them insane. And they are going to be driven very highly likely to suicidal ideation. So with peace and love, this is why I say most people don't deserve their children. And not that I believe in deserve, but I don't think most people are great parents. I think they're good enough and barely. This is why I say the world doesn't deserve your children. The same people that say they love their kids, and I do believe you love your kids, bro. I know my parents fucking love me, bro. There's no doubt about it. But they are literally the source of insanity. Because you are literally torturing a child, you know, 
and telling them you're not this, you're not this, you're not this, you're not this. Imagine if I did that to them, how it would drive them insane. And I know it would drive them insane because I did that to my parents and it drove them insane. They get angry. They yell. They get upset with you. They're like, you're so disrespectful. You're so disrespectful. I'm like, what do you think you're doing? So with peace and love, I know, I believe these people love their, their kid. But you might not deserve to have your kid. Not deserve. I hate that word. You might, the care for your child might not be in your hands. You know what I mean? Like with peace and love, your child might be better off with somebody else. I just, if you're going to mentally torture them every day, you know what I mean? Which was a Friday of 2023. Um, we had received a call from our local police department saying that our daughter had ingested. Um, or, no, at that point, they said she was making threats with another child to take her life. Wow. And it's important to realize that she was mad at us that day. There was a whole thing where um, we explained to her that she had to quit her summer job because school was getting ready to start. And um, so she was pretty mad at us. And mm. so this was what we viewed as her acting out and trying to get attention from another child. Mm. And so at 1.48 p.m., the local police officer called and I was on the phone with him and I stayed on the phone with him so that he could hear. And I walked back and I talked to our daughter and, you know, I said, hey, you know, what's going on? We're getting this report, blah, blah, blah. We kind of had a conversation and I reassured the officer that I don't believe she was coming through on any of these threats and that these threats were real, but we would. You know what's so funny? Parents will do this. Like they just want attention. They just want attention. Yeah. When a child throws a tantrum, they need your attention. You need to have a conversation about why they're seeking attention in this manner. Yeah. One of the burdens of being a parent is realizing your child, no matter how well you raise them, will throw a tantrum. And they will beg you for attention. And if they don't get it in the way that they're trying to convey to you they need it, it will feel like you don't want to give it to them because they're like, oh, they're just being a spoiled brat. But even that, if your kid is a spoiled brat, that is a cry for attention. And that is a cry that something went wrong. You are dysfunctional, bro. They're obviously asking for the right kind of attention. Right? Okay. So, hello. That's what I'm saying. People are not prepared to be parents. Like people do not think about this part of parenting. They're not thinking about it. They're just not, you know what I mean? Like they're not thinking about it. They're just thinking, oh, my kid is such a brat. They don't deserve attention. Well, you raised them. You gave them the environment. They're flourishing or not flourishing in your environment. You know what I mean? It's just so insane, bro definitely be watching her and making sure that she was safe. Mm. And if we felt we needed to, we would call the police or um, transport her to the hospital if, if anything that we felt was strange or, you know, that she was maybe going to go through with these threats. Right. Okay. And so that go was ahead. in the afternoon. Mm -hmm. And so then at so about 7.40 p.m. that evening is when Children's Services showed up at our door because they said the police officer could not speak to the child directly or lay eyes on her, even though he had never asked to do those things. He never came to our house. It was a simple phone call. Okay. So what happened after that? So, um, so we let her in the house and we gave her a tour of the house and we were kind of taken aback because we'd never been in that position. We didn't know what are you supposed to do? What do you expect? Yeah. So I actually showed her every room of our house, even like our bedroom and our bathroom. I was like, well, this is, you know, yeah. And then I showed her all the food in the fr in the freezers and stuff and, you know, how well stocked our house was with food. I was happy. I was making dinner at that point because we'd had a really late lunch that day. You know, it's interesting. This does happen, by the way. Queer kids will tell lies about their parents in order to get out of their situation because the normal truth isn't good enough for anyone to do anything about it. If you tell people like, hey, I'm a gay or LGBT kid in a conservative home and it's torturing me. That's not a good enough reason for people to take you away from your parents to most people. So what they do is they escalate the problem in order to be taken away before it actually gets to that point. And I guarantee you, it will get to that point. You know what I mean? And the problem is like they're teenagers, they're kids. They don't know how to do anything. And since you keep telling them no matter what, you will trap them in this home and you will mentally torture them by denying their LGBT status, you are basically giving your kid no other option but to do the extreme thing. That's why I say the world is a contribution. It's a reflection of us. The world is our karma as a whole. 
the whole universe is a well the the population of the earth is a reflection of us as a collective you know what i mean when I see like a teenager who's being rebellious, they're finding themselves. They're trying to figure out like, I don't feel good here. Who do I really want to be? That's a great question to ask yourself, right? Most people who are born into bubbles live in bubbles and die in bubbles and the bubbles they're born into. We all live in bubbles, but the bo- the ones you never, ever question, that is possible. But for many, many people, we usually question the bubble, leave the religion, leave the political association, leave the neighborhood, leave the expectation of the future behavior. We migrate to something else We change and it looks like, oh, we abandoned our family. We abandoned the place we came from. We are the ones causing the issue. And to be honest, in some ways, we are the ones causing the issue, but it's worth the cause of the issue. So teens don't know what to do. They're spiraling. They're so out of like control in their life. They escalate the claim just so somebody actually pays attention. And I, I've seen this time and time again, and I do think it's within reason because you as the parent, as the adult, have denied them any agency. So now they have to escalate, which was your action that caused it, right? And also, if they don't do anything, the risk of suicide is so much higher. If those kids don't get out of that environment, the risk of suicide is so much higher, you know? And so there's so much that goes into this. Um... Louise says when children lie, it's because they are scared, not feeling safe to speak what they truly are feeling and thinking. And ultimately, look, you might get a child that's a psychological anomaly. I think I've seen that in enough families where there's just a child who like is a chronic liar, who is a who is like a narcissist, who has a lot of mental issues, who who is really fucked and will tell lies about adults that never happened. Absolutely true. And sometimes it is like the psychology issue of the child. But in this circumstance, we're talking about a very basic thing. Normal teenager having gender dysphoria, wants to transition, parents are denying them that agency and even currently misgendering them, which is probably not looking good to them in terms of the legal system, right? Very funny that they don't learn. They're not They're not even trying to hide their transphobia. They're fully saying, we are not pro-trans, we will never validate this child's experience, and we will continue to misgender them. We will continue to contribute to the the statistical probability that that child will have more mental like anguish and problems, higher possibilities of suicidal ideation because of the way we believe and we think it trumps our child's feelings. Fine. Then you probably shouldn't have custody of your child, right? Because you are not invested in the health of that child. You are invested in your values more. Fine. Your religion, your beliefs are trumping your child's well-being. Fine. But then that means the state probably was within reason of taking your kid away from you since your actions statistically will contribute to the unending of that child, the unaliving of that child, right? So we've been working outside. And um, from there, she said, okay, well, we need to talk to your daughter. And um, I want to talk to her alone. And I was like, mm. uh, uh, okay. So they went and spoke on the porch for about 10 minutes alone. And then Todd and I were kind of like, we're not real comfortable with this. <clears throat> so we went outside and that's when we were told that she had ingested toilet bowl cleaner and um, possibly some kind of painkiller like ibuprofen or Tylenol and um, earlier in the day. So that is what was told to us. So we agreed then with Children's Services that she needed to go to the hospital and get. OK, first of all, toilet boy bowl cleaner. That is a dedication, bruh. That must have tasted gross. Checked, even though we were like. She, I know she didn't do that, but let's go get checked just for safety concerns. And you probably mm-hmm. wanted to show this person that, okay, we're taking her seriously and we take her health seriously. So, of course, we'll do the safest thing and take her to the emergency room. But I'm. You probably wanted to perform and let these people know. No, are you doing it for the safety of your child or are you doing it to perform for the authorities? We're take, Blondie. I'm sure, you're thinking, well, she doesn't have any signs <clears throat> of having just a toilet bowl cleaner. So it doesn't. Uh, Walkaway Man says this is difficult. What are the chances this child will be placed in a physically abusive home? So, spoiler, I, from my understanding of the articles I read, she's. Oops, say I just did it. Wait, the child, Leo, he is being placed in the custody of his bio mom. From what I read in the articles, but I don't know why the bio mom. So this is the stepmom. This is not the bio mom. This is the bio dad. From the articles I read, Leo wants to live with his bio mom. This is the stepmom. From my understanding of reading the articles. From my understanding. 
doesn't seem very feasible, but sure, we'll do, you know, we'll, we'll do what we need to do and we'll take her to the ER. I'm sure you were just thinking that's the right thing. Correct. So they had said that she reported she had taken these pills in this cleaner at about 3 p.m. Well, now it's after 8. And like you said, there were no signs of ingesting any kind of chemical, no, you know, throat burn, no sickness, no nothing. She was actually out in the yard playing with a dog like an hour before. OK, so it was a uh, fib. She told a fib or he. Oh, them misgendering them is throwing me off. He told a fib to get out of the home. OK, <sighs> that so she was jumping around mm -hmm. with the dog i just i knew it hadn't happened but i was like absolutely let's get this checked just for safety issues yeah right okay so you go to the er did you have any other um uh any conversation with the cfs official after that after you said okay we're going to the ER? did she just leave no, she she said, well, do you guys want to transport her and, and I'll come to the ER also because I have to follow up. And we were like, OK. OK, so I just want to show you guys. This is the article I read from uh, ABC News. So um, hold on. I just passed it. OK. Uh, OK, we got a call last night that they took her to Canada. Him, Leo. Buck. We got the call. After the fact, Krista said, we were told was, quote, your daughter is now in Canada with her birth mother. So Leo is now in Canada with his birth mother. Uh, that was it. Not how they got there or when did they get there? None of that. OK. Um, so that's what I was reading. And I was like, oh, this is interesting. We should cover this. So they're 14. Leo is 14 and now living in Canada with bio mom. That's what I, okay, but let's see how they tell the story in the interview. Okay, that's fine. You so when they said the government kidnapped our kid because we wouldn't reaffirm their trans um, experience. No, we don't have a problem with you following up. Obviously, we're taking this seriously. Not an issue. Yeah, and you're thinking because, you know, I've talked to other parents in a similar situation, typically parents who know that they've done nothing wrong. They are very open with these officials because they're thinking we have nothing to hide. Sure, come into our house. Look at our food. Look at the bedroom. Sure, come with us to the ER. There's, you know, we have we've done everything right. And so you're thinking. No, they're so dumb. You're so dumb. I love you with peace and love. You're so dumb. Look, we have food in our food. You're not reaffirming their gender experience, thus contributing to their mental health decline. Nobody gives a fuck if you have food in your fridge. Habibi, you're so dumb. Look, we have nothing to hide. You're literally being openly transphobic on the internet in every article, in every interview. The judgment is concerned for the safety of your trans child. They don't give a fuck how much food you have in the fridge. They want to know if you're going to reaffirm the gender of your child. Oh my God, they're so sweet. They're so sweet and innocent and so dumb. Like they literally, they're, they're missing the whole point. Not reaffirm, you're missing the point, the point over your head points. Thinking as long as they see that, everything will be fine. I'm guessing that was kind of your mentality at the time. Oh, exactly. We were like, we're hundred percent transparent. What do you want to look at? You know, and I kept asking her, I said, do you want to come and take pictures of our house and, and so that you have it for your record? Because, again, never been in that position, didn't know what to expect and didn't know what we were supposed to do. So we were absolutely 100 percent transparent and honest about everything. Yes. Yeah. OK, so she followed y'all to the ER, I assume. And what mm -hmm. happened from there? So we got to the emergency room that evening and they had they were doing they did some blood work on her, which we didn't see for another day or so. And um, then, you know, they they talked about how if if this is a suicide threat, somebody has to be admitted for 72 hours and watch to see what's going on. Like, why do you feel mm -hmm. this way? You mm -hmm. know, do we need to step in with treatment or anything like that? So we agreed mm -hmm. that she needed to be admitted and we were fine with that. And so then the next day is. Re Wait, what? Wait, did I miss something? Um, then, you know, they, they. Oh, transparent, transparent parents. OK, I heard that, too. I heard transparents and I was like, oh, but they meant transparent. I got it. Talked about how if if this is a suicide threat, somebody has to be admitted for 72 hours and watch to see what's going on. Like, why do you feel mm -hmm. this way? You mm -hmm. know, do we need to step in with treatment or anything like that? So we agreed mm -hmm. that she needed to be admitted and we were fine with that. 
And so then the next day is really when the problem started that Saturday, the 19th, um, when she was put in a private room and then there were people stationed outside. By the way, so many of the comments on these videos are like, never get the government involved, never do therapy, never involve the government. I agree. Never involve the government when it comes to the safety of your child. But the child involved the government because the child didn't know what else to do because you were mentally torturing them. So like, I agree. Right. Like, don't involve the government. But you you literally gave that child no other choice than to, like, basically appeal to government because you weren't listening and you're still not listening. Even the interviewer thinks this is about having food in the fridge. This is about you reaffirming the transness in your child, like the trans uh, event, like a uh, journey of your child. Her room all the time to watch her. So that's really when the issue started. Yes. And were you with her the whole time? So nurses, doctors, I guess they were coming in. They were trying to ask her questions. I'm sure trying to assess, did she actually do this? Why did she do this? And were you there during those interactions? We were there um, through late in the night. And then when they told us that she was going to be admitted, we went home that, that Friday night. Discord says, uh, imagine unintentionally abusing your child. I would be devastated. I think most people do. I'm trying to have a more realistic conversation around abuse because I think most parents do unintentionally abuse their kids because they're so fucked up themselves, they don't even know they're doing it. I think the best, most well-intentioned people, we just abuse each other and we don't even know it. And so obviously if you have like, um, you have to have a relationship with that because people hear abusive and they're like, oh my God, you think I'm abusive? And I'm like, well, what do you call this? Toxic? Inappropriate? I think misgendering your child, not listening to your child, putting your queer child at risk, putting your trans kid at risk. What would you call this? Because I I do think like in my opinion, in Brittany's opinion, for the way that I use language, I would say that this is unintentional abuse. Um, and it is still abusive, whether intentional or not. Like, what do you guys think? Uh, Siobhan, welcome to the memberships. Let's go. Let's go. Welcome to the memberships. Love it. Um, so what do you guys think about that? Because that is the hardest part when we're having these conversations is people think, oh my God, when you're being abused, you can never have a relationship with those people. But I don't really look at it like that. I look at it more like it's abusive. Let's see if you guys can process it that way so we can stop the abuse. And I, I think that most people, um, don't want to. Because it would, again, you know, they'd have to recontextualize their whole existence in order to do it. They don't want to agree. They don't want to agree to the fact that they're abusive because it would mean that they would probably have to change their behavior. So what they say is like, I'm not abusive. I'm just very like, I'm not abusive. I have values. I'm not abusive. I'm religious. I'm not abusive. I'm a man. I'm not abusive. This is just how women are, you know? So it's like, okay. Okay, how do we have a relationship with that, you know? So then the next day, which was Saturday, um, I did go and I spent, every day I would spend four or five, six hours at the hospital. Just, you know, just so, even though she, I knew she was really mad at us, but I wanted to make a point to her that we're your parents and we're not going to go away. You know, no matter what's going on, we're going to be there for you. And that's why I spent so much time at the hospital. Okay, and so what happened then the next day when you showed up? Because you said Friday the 18th, this is Saturday the 19th, and you said this is when things really started to get bad and accelerate. So what was going on? Almost immediately there was talk from our daughter and from doctor or medical staff uh, talking about Wyoming. And it was um, so much that we thought, okay, let's take a look at what's special about Casper, Wyoming. And it was what we saw on the maps was Montana, North and South Dakota, Idaho. They all have laws banning um, gender care and tran um, transitioning a, a child without parental approval. Wyoming does not have those laws in place. Mm. And that's um, where she wanted to go. And that's where they were talking about sending her. Well, and also right from the get go, the minute I got there on that Saturday morning, I was confronted with an aide who was calling her Leo and he him. And I was like, hey, that's not a birth name. We're not OK with that. I don't feel bad for them. 
I don't. I mean, they're not my parents, so I don't have to feel bad for them. But man, I do sort of feel bad for conservatives because they just don't get it. They don't get it, bro. They don't get it. And it's kind of sad. I wish I could talk to them. Maybe I'd be able to help them because like, bro, they don't get it. <sighs> they just don't get it. This is not what we're here for. And immediately they started kind of chastising Todd and I as parents like, oh, well, you need to respect what she what she wants. She wants to be called Leo. And that's what or we're going to do. He was probably saying they were probably saying he. <laughs> yeah, they were saying yeah. he. And so right from the get go, there, there was problems. And I explained to the nurses on duty that I was unhappy and that according to um, Bill 99, which I see they made it about themselves. They made it about themselves. They don't give a fuck about their kid unless it's in the way they understand, which is, by the way, not evil of them. It's actually very human. Most people can't care about other people unless they understand the problem. And since they just don't understand trans people, they're not going to be able to understand their son. You know what I mean? They're just not going to be able to connect. And so a part of me would want to like explain it to them, sort of like you believe in God and we want to respect that, even though it's a belief in a relationship you're having with yourself and no one else. That's how being trans is, is they're having a relationship with themselves and this journey is real, right? But they made it about themselves. We're not okay with this. Don't tra like, don't like, don't call our kid this. Your kid is obviously crying out for help and you're making it about you. Because they really, and this is fair, really do put God above, God above their children, which I think if you're religious makes sense because it's about values. And this is why I say if you're going to choose your religion over your child, then you deserve to lose custody of your child, right? If you're going to create this environment for your kid, if you are a religious person that puts your religion above your child, but not at the expense of your child, then I think you can keep your child. Does that make sense? Do you guys know the difference? If you're going to torture your child because of your religion, you can't have a child. If you're going to not torture your child while being religious, you can have a child. Do we all agree? Sort of? Do we at least understand? I'm still a little confused about Bill 99 if it ever would into effect or not. But I, at the time, I thought it was in effect. And I said, according to Bill 99, these are not things that you're allowed to do. And they said it was a gray area that they weren't giving her puberty blockers or hormones. And right. so they were allowed to address her as a male and give her, they were giving her male products to use, um, you know, body wash and deodorant and things like that. Oh my goodness. Yeah, and we, we were staying completely respectful and kind to the doctors. It wasn't con confrontational in any way, but they were being just the opposite, completely right. the opposite. And so they, they don't get it. Like they can't get it. Basically, I'm trying to give them an example. See, that's the problem. I'm going to say this, and this is a generalization, because I do treat my parents to their face extremely aware of their cultural uh, bubble. So, like, I don't cuss in front of my parents. You know, sometimes it slips out. I don't bring up politics. I try, like, when they say, like, I can't wait for you to come back to church, I just go, okay. But, like, if I every day treated my parents the way they treat me, they would eventually get triggered and we probably would go some time without talking. And some, you know, if I was a more petty person, I would do that because in my 20s I was petty and I did do it. I'm just not that petty anymore and I just don't care. But obviously with cases like this, like they're not getting it. So I almost want to like talk to them, like these parents be like, look, Habibi, let me tell you. But, you know, which is why, again, you will hear me say if you don't have a relationship with your parents, it's a for it's like dysfunctional. It is dysfunctional. It's also better to not have a relationship with your parents, move away from the dysfunction, become the less dysfunctional yourself, and have a better life. If being around your parents makes you less functional, thus making you dysfunctional, get away from your parents. But also, if you would like to have a connection with your parents, then you have to have the wisdom and patience to create a bridge of communication that allows a limited but joyful relationship with those people which I practice with my parents. I love them. We have a limited and joyful relationship that is better than nothing, but it is absolutely only what it ever can be. I do not ever dream of my parents being pro-LGBT, but my parents can continue for the rest of their life dreaming that I will be Catholic and anti-LGBT. That is a dream they can have for me, 
I don't have that dream for nobody. I do not wish for people to be different. I only wish for people to be introspective and to be considerate of other people and how they live their life. Basically, these parents keep serving meat to a vegan and they don't understand why the vegan's upset with them. Because you're rude. Because you're rude and obnoxious. That's why you're not having a good understanding of the situation. You keep trying to serve meat to a vegan. You're being incredibly inconsiderate. Yeah. Some of the things that happened at the hospital that were alarming were, um, you know, the aide that was outside the door that was talking about how she identified as non-binary and she herself was going to go to a different city in, in Montana and get top surgery. Um, so that was that was alarming. And we were like, hey, this the is aide was saying that about herself. Yeah, about herself. She, okay, that's what she, she was she saying, was well, OK, so this is so a, the aide was relating adult so that's legal so she was saying i'm gonna go get top surgery i guess trying to i don't know what show y'all that it's okay or yeah it's a bond trying to, to say i know what i'm talking about it I, was in front of our daughter yeah she was right there between yeah the aide was trying to give hope to leo so our daughter was in the middle of us and that person yeah, so, so the aide was, was sitting outside the door and we were sitting like on the other side of the room and then our daughter was in the bed in the middle. And so she was having yeah. these conversations and, and saying these things and um, we just were like, hey, this isn't, we don't need to know that much about your personal life. We're good, you know, we don't. I bet if that aide said, you know, I'm a Christian and I used to be trans, but I'm not trans anymore, you can get through this, the parents would have loved it. And that's the issue. That's the thing I want everyone to pay attention to. If that aide had said, I used to be trans and now I'm a Christian and I love Jesus and I thought I was trans too, they would have loved that shit. They would have been like, yes, oh, my daughter, according to them, has an aide who really sees her and like is bonding and blah, blah, blah. But instead, because the aide was trying to reaffirm Leo's gender and Leo's experience, they saw the aide as the enemy. And this is why I ask you to question your bias and prejudice and to question how you are contributing to the world being the way it is. So many parents will, you know, why don't my kids talk to me? Why don't my kids want to live around me? Why don't my kids have a closer relationship with me? Well, do, do you in, like invalidate them every time they talk to you? Hello? And yeah. so I don't know if she was trying to convince us that that was okay or if she was just kind of bragging like, well, I do these things on my own. Like, I'm not sure what her Ugh. point was. So inappropriate, no matter what, in front of a child. So it's not inappropriate. It's only inappropriate because they said something you didn't like. Again, this is the conundrum of existing. All of your values are a construct. So yes, it is, un in un it is inappropriate in front of a child in this bubble. And that's right. Most of religious people would agree this was super inappropriate within their bubble. So again, we're talking about bubbles conflicting. So the parents created this beautiful bubble. They're so happy. They have these children in their bubble. And they're like, look at this great thing we gave you. And one of their kids, Leo, is like, yeah, I don't like this bubble. And they're like, you don't like our bubble? But we, but it's, we're so happy here. Why don't you like this bubble? And they can never believe that somebody wouldn't want to be a part of it. Right? So here we are in conflict and they're going to have to realize that in so many years when this child is an adult and they're not talking to them, that this was a, this was a decision that all parties made together by not understanding how each other are different. And this is often a very like common case with most religious parents and LGBT kids. This is why I say, I love my religious family. I love religious people, but obviously my life would be easier without this bubble. Because this bubble doesn't live in a world where you get to coexist with them. They do not want you to exist. They see you as a threat to existence. They see you as the reason the world is ending. They see you as a... So again, as much as I like appreciate the religious, yeah, ideally like the world wouldn't be able to discriminate against other people because of religion. Okay? So again, I don't know why parents are so shocked when their kids don't want to contact with them when every time they make contact with them, they invalidate. And, mm -hmm. and it just in a professional setting in general, 
you guys didn't ask what she was preparing to do to her body or how Correct. she identified. Hmm. Yeah. That's extremely I didn't think I asked what her name was. So, I mean. Even on her food. Like, yeah. yeah, and yeah. there were other incidents at the hospital. Like, there was a nurse that was stationed outside the door, and um, a tray of food had come. And when I when I mentioned to our daughter, you should eat something healthy on your tray, because they were kind of she she was eating whatever she wanted and that's like she was getting things like oh i want rice and um a milkshake and i'm like well there's no value nutritionally in that and so we were aware of like what she was eating and things like that so there was one um day when lunch came and i said to her you should eat something healthy on your tray and the a the nurse she was an rn she was at the door and she just kind of <sighs> rolled her eyes at me and did one of those. And then she screamed down the hallway, get this young man a banana split dessert. So things like that were happening constantly. Were we it's being so... undermined? Yeah. These people's priorities are very clear. It is definitely not their kid. Their priority is not their child. I'm sorry. Go ahead. It's their own feelings, how they feel. They make it all about them, which, by the way, is pretty common with all parents especially parents who grow up like not being able to, you know, express themselves in front of their parents, you know? I mean, no, I was just going to say our, our, our rights and as parents and our, our authority as parents were being constantly undermined the entire, entire time she was in the hospital. So incredibly unprofessional and harmful. Also, it seems that they were trying to set an example for your daughter that <laughs> it's okay to disrespect your parents. Your parents don't know know what they're talking about they don't get it we're in the know they're not in the know we want what's best for you they don't I mean that is dystopian and I'm sure very scary and just confusing for you as parents I find it really interesting how much the stepmom is doing talking rather than the own father um it's pretty common in a lot of religious bubbles women talk more uh, I know like there's this idea that a lot of religious bubbles are like patriarchal, but like a lot of the religious bubbles, the women speak and the men don't not it's because women are better at it. Like in my bubble, my mom speaks more than my dad to people. My dad's quiet. Like the men are often more quiet. Um, I find it to be much more common for the women to speak more than the men. But that's again, because the women are better at like socializing because men aren't socialized like to be very good with like cameras or people or interviews. Um, but women are, you know, good at hosting. They're good in that bubble. They're like good at speaking. So I, I find it pretty typical that the mom is speaking more. The stepmom is speaking more. Yeah, this is the stepmom. The child, Leo, is now with their bio mom in Canada. So that's the thing. They keep saying the government kidnapped their kid. They replaced Leo in the care of his mother, his bio mother. It sounds like you tried to be as kind and uh, transparent as possible and then to basically be treated like you guys don't know anything and are actually harming your daughter. That's got to be really hard. Right. Within um, just a couple of days of her being there, the effects were loud and clear. We saw a whole new side of her. It was like that enabled her and it built her confidence in it. Yep. And she turned it into something entirely different. So, but. Man, this this is so annoying. This is so annoying, right? Wolf says that the stepmom should stay out of it if you ask me. I believe in the validity of step parents personally. I think they I think if unless you have a dysfunctional relationship with your step parents, like I really value step parents, obviously. So I don't think the stepmom should stay out of it. If the mom and she might not even be referenced as a stepmom, right? Because like not all families do that. Like some families don't even acknowledge like half siblings because they acknowledge them as full siblings. So I, I, you know, there's a chance that they consider their, this, their mom as much as they, they might even consider, like Leo might say, I have two moms. You know what I mean? By the yeah. time she had been there three or four days, it was, she was not even the same child at all. Not even mm -hmm. a trace. And so. I think parents, you know, it's so interesting Parents do this thing where they neglect to learn their child. When the child shares, they reject it. They reject it. They reject it. And after years of rejecting who their child is, they go, my child changed. I don't even know them anymore. Well, yeah. Because you you didn't get to know them. Dummy. 
result. You know, that's that's what people say that social transitioning that that's it's no big deal being called different pronouns or different names that you know that has no effect. No, it has that exact effect. It exactly. affirms it affirms the wrong idea that someone has that they are the opposite sex and it gives them a, a very negative uh, confidence to continue to affirm their own delusions that then leads down the path of mutilating your body in the name of trying to be something that you will never be, which is the opposite sex. That's what I'm saying. Now put it together. Your child in your mind will never be the opposite sex. So for the well-being of your child, they cannot be in your home. And you know what's so funny? Again, if you ask religious people, Hey, do you think it, don't you think it's so great? Like, uh, um, my friend's an atheist, but like, um, they're recently converting to Christianity, but they're only 14. So their parents don't want them to, they'd be like, oh, that's so awful. That's so awful. They're not letting their kid, tr you know, become Christian. Ooh, I, I should test my parents. <gasps> should I fake test my mom? I could do that. I could be like, Hey mom, uh, question hypothetical. It's not a trick. Hypothetical. Uh, you know, if it, if a teenager in an atheist home wanted to be Christian, would that be good or bad? It's like people want to undermine authority of parents if it's for a direction they believe in, but not for a direction if they don't believe in it. What if it was a progressive family that wanted to transition their kids? Some people are crazy and they like want to, their kids to transition or be gay. What if they were like, oh, my God, the kid didn't want to transition. So they got taken away from their parents. They'd be like, oh, that's so much better for the kid. And that's what I mean by bubbles. We all have ideas of what is good and bad. But ultimately, forcing your kid against their better mental health is probably the bad thing, regardless of what it is. Religion, transitioning. If you Don't force your kids to be things that are counterintuitive to their mental health. So listen to your kid when they say, mom, like this is torturing me. Dad, I'm really in pain. You know, like I'm, I'm really feeling a way about this. You know what I mean? Like, listen to your kids. They will tell you. And so as yes. this was happening, uh, yes, as this was happening, what were you guys thinking? Well, we were very alarmed and um, Children's Services was involved this entire time. So we were telling everybody that we're not okay with this. This is not okay. You know, the doctor on duty as well as Children's Services. And um, Children's Services was like, well, you know, it, I understand why you're upset and, and things like that. But at that point, we weren't sure because we, we knew every day um, hold. And then um, after that, they said, well, she's still having these feelings of suicide, even though her blood work had come back and there was no pills or clean or anything in her blood work. And mm. so. Um, what does that matter? This is what I mean. They're invalidating. They don't think their kid wanted to unalive themselves. They're invalidating the suicidal ideations and they think they're just doing it for attention. Yeah, they want attention. They're trying to get out of this environment. <sighs> this is bringing back my childhood, bro. I feel like my childhood all over again, bro. It's my childhood all over again. Oof. Um, they had suggested that she go to um, acute psychiatric care and, and inpatient counseling to help her through this episode. And Todd and I absolutely agreed with that. Yes. Okay. We were like, sure, whatever needs to be done to help her, we're 100% we're on board. So that's when we, you know, things started kicking off. Like we were told there were six facilities in the state of Montana. And um, we expressed that we would prefer Billings because that's where we went often for medical already and it would be convenient. We understood with six facilities, you should be able to find some place for her to stay. And that's when they kept bringing up Wyoming over and over again. that we've got merch at the Apple Gray. go to they were continuing to say that she needs to go to Wyoming and what happened after it that. wasn't just that they were saying it it was how they were saying it um there was always glass uh discord says what are your feelings on the age of consent and how it factors into this children can drink or smoke or whatever but they can decide they're trans not saying this is this to invalidate as I'm trans and grew up in a similar way to this young boy um, I think, okay, so my honest answer is every child deserves specific care. So each child is a specific consciousness. In my belief, you do not raise kids all the same. So I even think different rules apply to different children. Okay, so that kind of sounds unfair to people, but I actually think the fairest way to treat a child is uniquely. So playing 
to your child's strengths and helping them grow past their weaknesses, right? So though your child um, may want to drink, and maybe you could justify that. My parents used to buy me alcohol, but not in the party way. Like, Parents who buy their children alcohol to party, like that's super weird. My parents would just let me have a beer or some brandy while I read books because I read a book every day. Like I was an avid reader. I've been in reading competitions like as a child, very small ones, like your local library ones, like very cute ones, you know, like you want to bookmark. And I would like read, 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 read. I've read thousands of books. Like I'm ups- I, like I was obsessed. And I'd be like, can you buy me brandy so I could be like Hemingway and drinking brandy? I was a very non-disruptive child, except that I was queer and rebellious I'm very politically minded, okay? <clears throat> but I didn't do hard drugs. I never had sex. Like, I was a very, for the most part, like, pretty good kid. Never got in trouble with the law. Never, none of that, right? But I was incredibly opini- opinionated. So I think if you really trust your child and you understand your child, like, they can consent to having a beer at dinner at 16. I think they can consent to having a cigar at 18. I think they can consent to some things. And I think you can trust them to know that about themselves in a big way. Obviously, there's not going to be a lot of harm associated with one beer once a year at, you know, dinner. But if your kid is asking for alcohol and alcohol and they're drinking and drinking and drinking, obviously, we're not going to let them consent to that because the amount of alcohol they're drinking is impacting their health. It's bad for themselves in relation to the law. And they're going to get into more harm. So we're talking about harm reduction. In a literal sense. So children who think they're trans or are experiencing a trans relationship with themselves, right? Like they might not even, you know, be making a concrete decision. They might just be on the journey of questioning. So it's not that they're consenting to being trans. They're consenting to going on the journey of discovering if they're trans. And then because the world expects you to know who you are, They might make the wrong decision of thinking they're trans when they're not or thinking they're cis when they're not or thinking they're religious when they're not or thinking they're something that they're not. And so the responsibility you have as a parent is to allow the child to make a decision they might regret or to make a decision that they think is the right one and isn't. You know, my husband and I talk about this. What would you do if you had a trans kid is my favorite first date question because I think it just knocks out so many of the wrong dates on that first date. And look, I don't want to physically transition my kid unless it is 1,000 billion percent the best decision for my kid. Then I'm open to it. Versus these parents aren't even open to their kid being trans at all. Like they're not even, they don't even believe in trans people. And you guys know we believe in trans people here. Trans people are valid. And I think trans kids are real. Like that's a real experience kids are going through. I believe in the validity of trans kids, right? Do I think my child will have all of the knowledge at 14 to know if they want to have a double mastectomy? I don't know. I don't know this child. I don't know the like the the doctors we've been talking to. I don't know. It could be a huge regret. And I think we should teach people to live and not drown in their regret, to have a good and wholesome relationship with their regret. Sometimes you make decisions that weren't the best for you. But as long as you make them with the best intentions, we can talk about the aftermath. Now, of course, that does not take away the damage that will be done. There will be, something will be done. Denying your child the right to transition might cause a suicide. suicide. Transitioning your kid when they're not ready might cause a suicide. So we side on caution and we allow the child to explore within reason the experiences that they're having in a way that is safe and reasonable for the kid, right? So obviously like, I understand the fear of kids transitioning as minors. I think that's a reasonable fear, but I think the fear is often for the wrong reason. And the fear usually comes from people that don't believe in trans people to begin with. So their fear isn't that the kid will transition. Their fear is their kid, who they don't even believe is trans in the first place, will quote, and I'm using their words, mutilate their bodies. And that's why I don't believe their concerns, because their concerns are rooted in the fact that they don't even believe in trans kids in the first place. And that's frustrating. Like that's incredibly frustrating, right? So if your parents are only supportive of you, right? Like I remember when my brother was having problems at home, my parents would take him to therapists and they would try to help him. They're like, we got him the help. But ultimately, excuse me, ultimately you don't believe in him being gay. So ultimately your hope through the therapy is that he realizes that being gay is wrong. And they were like, well, of course. And I'm like, right. So you're not getting them him, him 
the help he needs. You're getting him the help that looks good on paperwork so you can say you did it, but you hope he still ends up not gay or not engaging in gayness, right? So again, I I think like children can consent to a journey and then we can have conversations in the right situations to in regards to whether or not we end up getting surgery. Because realistically, like any medical procedure, and I consider transitioning a medical procedure, any medical procedure you're having as a child, you're hoping your parents will make the right decision for you. And sometimes denying your child that transition is the wrong decision for them. But it's a case by case basis, right? It's a case by case basis, you know? (sighs) Answers towards our daughter when there was affirming glances like even though we're telling you your your parents that there's going to be a bed in billings we're just saying that to them you're going to wyoming there was that's kind of what the the glances said to us and it's important to note that as soon as wyoming was brought up we researched what the laws were in wyoming because we had been so disrespected as parents up to that point we didn't trust the hospital or cps or anybody involved i mean that was a good instinct on their part because the hospital didn't trust you either girl i mean that was kind of a good instinct on their part to be fair they're right the parents the hospital didn't trust them and the hospital was going around them and they absolutely were disrespecting their status as parents because you failed as parents their actions of parents proved they had failed the care and support of their child. Again, even if they didn't want their kid to be trans. So this is what I would do if I was a conservative. Okay. This is what I would recommend to these parents. You don't have to reaffirm your kid's trans journey to give your kid the best care and love and support. But you have to respect the fact that your child is on this journey. And in order to get through this journey, You need to respect the agency of your child unless you believe your child doesn't have agency to such a degree that you believe you have the right to mentally torture your child. And if they say, I don't want to mentally torture my child, then I would say, tell your child, we, because of our religion, cannot support you in an LGBT way, but we as your parents can support the fact that you're on a journey. And from now on, we will gender you correctly. It make, it's very hard for us as your parents because, you know, we gave you this lovely name and we have this lovely relationship with you, but we're happy to be with you on this journey because we'd rather be in your life than not in it. And regardless of what you choose, moving into your adulthood, I still have to be Christian and I still have to adhere to my own values. But as your parents, as the people that birthed you, we would still like to maintain a relationship with you regardless of how different you are from us. And so again, we will gender you correctly. We will say the right name. But it's still difficult. We don't want to send the wrong message to you. We don't want you to think, oh, my parents support us. We, as your parents, support you. We don't support you transitioning. So again, I would recommend that these conservative parents get to the point where they can gender their child correctly without saying that they're pro-trans, right? So again, I don't think they want to do that, though. I think they're not willing to do that. My parents certainly wouldn't be willing to do that. So if they're not willing to do that, then they have failed as parents, okay, and succeeded as Christians, congratulations, and you have chosen your religion over the sanctity or obligation you had as parents to uphold the sanity of your child, and because of that, you will now lose rights over your child because you are willing to pick your God over the sanity of your own child, which is your right. And now, because the law values the safety of children, the child has found a way to protect themselves using that law, in order to get them the help they need. And reminder that this child is now living with their bio mother in Canada. And these parents are trying to fight for custody of that child because they don't want the mother to reaffirm the trans journey in that child. And so we, in the very room, when, when Wyoming was brought up, we brought it up on our phones and we said, it looks to us like Wyoming doesn't have the same laws that Montana has. And what, how would we be protected? Who's protecting our daughter? You know, what is this going to look like? How would this work? And our CPS worker, I'll never forget her answer. She she said, well, chances of Wyoming are really, really slim. And she's most likely just yeah. going to be in Montana. So we'll all cross that bridge together when we come to it. It's not going to be an issue. Yeah, that was what she said. Okay, so you feared because of things that were being said that she was going to be moved to Wyoming because Wyoming allows this quote unquote gender affirming care uh, for young people. But you were being. Okay, so uh, 
Zen said it's not really supporting the child as they are and will always hurt them. The child knows their parents aren't okay with who they are. Grow up. At that point, we all have to grow up and realize people do not like how we are. Right? <clears throat> so ultimately, we do have to grow up and we have to recognize nobody likes how we are. Right? Alex said very love the sinner, not the sin. Yes. Yes. We don't like each other. We don't like conservatives. We don't like trans people. We don't like blacks. We don't like whites. We don't like Muslims. We don't like Jews. We don't like each other. But we still have to get along. I recommend liking each other, but that seems to be impossible for people, right? Parents and kids do not, you're, you're giving birth to a consciousness you haven't met yet. They are not obligated to like you. You're not obligated to like them. But if you would like a relationship with them, you better sit your booty down, okay? And learn to get along with people when you disagree. If you're not going to get along with people when you disagree, if you're not going to learn to actually see people as people outside of your own belief system, then you contribute to the conflict of the world. Zen says fake love. It's not about fake love. It's not. It's not about faking love, right? Natalie says that your parents don't love you at that point. Total disagree. That's trauma. This is trauma. Brittany's calling it right now. This is trauma. This is your trauma. That's not what love is. Love is not agreeing with you. Love does not mean to agree with you. That's not what love is. That's not what love is, guys. If you think love in your bubble means somebody has to see and understand every part of you, good luck being loved. And also, I don't even know how you could love humanity or anyone in that case. See, I love everybody because I know everybody is me on a journey, right? Love is real, but love is not about seeing every part of you, right? And loving someone unconditionally does not mean condoning their behavior. I love people in my life so unconditionally, I do not condone their behavior. And if you need me to condone your behavior to love you, you're not understanding love. Unconditional love means I love you regardless of what you do. That doesn't mean I condone your behavior, right? So again, yes, you can feel that way. But again, when I say love, okay, unconditional love. These parents love their kid. The kid loves their parents. That doesn't mean they have to get along, right? You can love your kid and not the actions they take, right? But when you give birth to a child, you're giving birth to a unique consciousness that might not be anything like you or believe anything you believe. Okay, now take this version of love you have in your head and how does it work with humans all over the planet, right? Like, I think of love as something universal, a connection with humanity, a connection with living things, a commu co connection with plants and animals, a love for life. A love for life does not mean it has to go the way that makes me feel comfortable, right? So have your boundaries. And look, some of you, might actually be in a situation where somebody doesn't actually love you who happens to be your parent. Absolutely valid. But make sure that's what it is because you're not gonna be able to forgive yourself or other people and you're not gonna let go of the trauma unless you actually acknowledge that they're on a journey as much as you are, right? Like as much, like we're all on a journey and that journey is gonna make us like think ill of people that it's not necessary. Or think highly of people, that's not necessary. Okay? So again, if for whatever reason you're with people who actually don't love you and you don't love them, then it is okay to create a distance. It is okay to say, mm, I'm open, but I have boundaries. Or I'm closed because those are my boundaries. You know? Miss Fishy says, how can you tell if someone does or doesn't love you? Um, well, first, you have to have a relationship with love. So first, it starts with you. Because I thought my whole life my parents didn't love me, but that wasn't true. And after therapy, I realized, oh my God, it's not that they didn't love me. It's that they couldn't even see me fully, and I kept expecting them to. I kept expecting them to see me fully so they could love me. But they already loved all the parts of me they understood. They loved, they loved me so much, bro. My dad, the other day, I sent them a little video. And my dad goes, is that, is that Brittany? She's my life, man. She's really my life. 
I'm my dad's life. I'm his whole life. I'm his firstborn. I'm his girl. I'm like his little girl, bro. I'm always going to be that five-year-old little girl who did, he was doing my hair for kindergarten. My dad used to do my hair for kindergarten. I went to public, a private Catholic school for a few months, guys. Lore. They love me. But they don't see every part of me. And the parts they cannot see, they do not love. But I never needed that from anyone. Because you know what? If I'm going to be real with you, I've only met one person who loves all of me. And that's my husband. I've never found that in people. Most people that I see and know, every person in my inner circle, there are parts of me they'll never be able to see. And parts of me they probably should never see. But I know my parents love me, bro. I know. Cry emojis in the chat, bro. My dad is such a, like a, he loves me, bro. And he's still the dad that didn't talk to me for two years because I disrespected him. He's still the dad that couldn't come to my wedding because he has a religion. He's still the dad that created an environment for his kids not to feel necessarily safe all the time because they're religious, because that's who they are. And they're on a journey themselves. They rebelled from their parents to make the world that they thought was better for their kids. And their kids are going to rebel from their parents to make a world that's better for their kids. And that is the like cycle of life. That is literally what life is. Life is looking at your parents and saying, I'm going to do better than you did. But man, thanks for doing better than your parents did. And that's the goal for humanity. Do better than your parents did every generation. But most people will continue cycles. And most people repeat the mistakes their parents made. And most people won't break generational curses because it's too goddamn hard. You won't do it the same way your parents didn't do it. Because it's way too goddamn hard. Right? I've, I've really decided I think I'm going to break mine by not having kids. I'll, I'll let you guys know when I really fully have. But like I'm pretty sure my contribution to breaking generational curses is not having children which I never thought it was. I thought it was to have children and raise them better. But I actually think it's to not have children. That's a big deal. And nope, my parents are not going to understand it. They're going to hate it. But they also don't understand that it's about breaking generational curses. Right? Okay. Okay. The relationship is, up, relationship is up to you. If I, what I'm saying doesn't resonate with you, ignore it, right? But it's really up to you, the relationship you want to have with love and seeing people and understanding they're on a journey just like you. Being told, oh, no, no, no. She's just going to go to Billings. No big deal. Well, what unfolded exactly. after that? Right. So then on the evening of August 22nd, when I left the hospital that day, we were told she was next in line for a bed in Billings. So we were like, Okay, you know, maybe a day or so and, and she'll be going down to Billings and we're totally fine with that. So later on that evening, it was between 730 and 8, um, we got a call from the hospital saying that this bed had opened up in Wyoming and that she had to go. Mm. So we weren't, at that point, we didn't even know the name of the facility. We weren't told the name of the facility. We weren't told what are our rights. How does that work if a child goes out of state? Once you've requested that they stay in Montana, you know, we had all these questions and concerns and we wanted them answered and we were like, okay, well, who can we talk to? Who, who needs to be involved in this to help us and answer our questions and clarify these things. And we were basically told she's not doing any good here in the hospital. She has to go to Wyoming, period. Are you hmm. refusing the bed? And we said, we want our questions answered. We are very firm on that. And yeah. so they, um, within they 10 minutes then, they showed up at our home, removing our daughter from our care, saying that we were unable or unwilling to provide yeah. medical care when that's oh that's goodness. not the truth at all. Yeah, they, they simply would not answer any questions about what our rights were. Um, could she be transitioned without our approval like we read online? We They would answer nothing. So, oh, oh my goodness, I can't even imagine the dis the question is, can you send your kids back to in a home where there's a chance out of a suicidal ideation increasing? Can you send kids back into that home? Spared that you guys felt at that point. I mean, what was it like watching your daughter walk out of your home and have no having no idea what's going to happen to her? Well, she it was it was crushing. I mean, we're and you don't know who do you who do you turn to? Who do you talk yeah. to? Who can help you? You know, all these things. Mm. Natalie, you said, so parents saying I love you, but I just hate that you are who you are. Totally love you, though, with loving your kids. Um, I don't know exactly what circumstance you're speaking to, 
But if you can understand that perspective from a perspective in which it could make really perfect sense in that bubble, I think you'll have your own answer. But also, I don't know what you mean, right? Because like some parents don't love their kids. Not all parents love their kids. Not all kids love their parents. So if you mean what I'm talking about is what happens in a scenario where your parents actually do love you, but they don't approve of your lifestyle and they don't know how to come to terms with that. I'm not talking about parents who do not love you because some parents do not love their kids. It's not a guarantee you will love your offspring. It's not a guarantee your offspring will love you. That is so important to remember your animals on a planet, guys. There is no guarantee you will love the people who gave birth to you or adopted you. There's no proof your kids will love you whether you adopt them or give birth to them. There's zero guarantee. The probability is very high, but it's not guaranteed. So again, I'm talking about scenarios where the parents for sure love their kids, but do not understand their choices, which is a very common phenomenon in people, which is a part of those generational curses. Because we do not understand other people, we think the worst of them. Because we cannot believe other people would be different from us, could be happy being different from us, we assume the worst from them. And sometimes it's true. Sometimes people join a religion because they're traumatized. Sometimes people are trans because they're traumatized. Sometimes people do a lot of things for the wrong reasons. The question is, what is the reason? Why is it happening? What is the relationship that is that is actually occurring? Not the one you're assuming, not the one you think is happening, not the one your trauma is telling you is what is actually for real happening, right? Zen says, I understand what you mean, Brittany, but a lot of people can't compartment car compartmentalize the way your parents have. Um, I know I've been to therapy and I've done a lot of philosophy work. I really recommend it. I really think my introspective journey helped me have more compassion for everyone on this planet because I know like I know how complicated it is to be a person and I never want to think well I you know what I mean that I'm like that I'm not a part of the cycle as much as anyone else. You know what I mean? Natalie said, what people are trans because of trauma? I mean, sometimes do you think every single trans person is having the same experience? Of course, of course, there's going to be a person who's trans because of trauma. There are lesbians because of trauma. Girl, have you not heard of the lesbians because of trauma bubble? There's a whole group of feminist activists. I love this bubble. So interesting, right? Where they're only lesbians because they're traumatized by men. So they're lesbians by choice. It's a phenomenon. Human beings are not a monolith. Every kind of person exists on the planet, right? Every single kind of person exists on the planet. So no one is having the same lived experience. Only the categories are. So the reason I categorize people is because like, like every single person's having their own ex unique experience, but your unique experience can be categorized, right? So yes, of course, some people transition because of trauma. And then some people transition to alleviate trauma. Some people transition because that's their joy. Some people, you know what I mean? Like it, oh, everybody exists. Think about it. It probably exists, right? Discord said his farm brother perpetuating generational curses, some of them, but he's trying to eradicate some of them, right? Natalie says, that's just something I hear transphobes say. Yes, I agree with you. I think a lot of transphobes don't have a lot of nuance about the uniqueness of a lived experience, which is why when they see a detransitioner, they think that's proof that being trans is not real. And I would say that is proof that the human being, the human's experience is diverse and not monolithic. So when I see a detransitioner, I'm like, oh, cool, different life. When I see a trans person, I'm like, cool, different life. When I see a Muslim, I'm like, cool, different life. When I see somebody, I'm like, cool, different life, like different life. Like, oh, okay. And then I judge through my values whether or not I could be in that lifestyle without it being kind of like wrong, right? But again, what I what I think doesn't mean what you think, right? And so I think there's like, you know, I want to, I want to, allow all the nuance. I want to say there is a possibility for this to exist in a way that makes sense. I believe people can consent to toxic relationships. I believe some people are victims of toxic relationships. I believe you can be a victim and choose to continue being one and it still be okay. Not okay. Not okay, but you know what I mean. Within your right as a consenting adult. I just think human beings are having so many different experiences. So I always ask myself when I do something, ooh, what category of person am I and why am I doing this? Like I'm not, like if I decide not to have kids, I noticed we don't fall into the dink category, double income, no kids. That's not really a lifestyle that's interesting to me, but it is a bubble of types of people who do not have kids. 
And isn't that funny? Like there's a whole group of people that think every person who decides not to have a kid is like one kind of person. But we know that's not true. Like we know that's not true. So we're just trying to we're trying to add that part of the nuance to the conversation, you know? And you, and you, you realize that the, things are escalating quickly and it's, it's way out of your control and nobody will answer your question. So it was very disheartening and very upsetting. Yeah. And, and so what happened after that? So on August 23rd, um, she was transported to Wyoming by a CPS worker. And part of our concerns on that transport were, even though they said, you're not allowed to talk to her, you're not allowed to see her before she goes, they allowed her to go and um, go to her her summer job and tell you know tell her friends and visit with her friends all, about all kinds of things mm -hmm. regarding her personal life and so we were we were upset about that um, where we're at it's very very small and you know I don't care about what people think about us but our main goal is to protect her and her mental health and her privacy. Yes, she was allowed to make phone calls to whoever say that she was suicidal, say that. Um, she was transgender. She was telling a lot of people this. And so we w weren't sure if that was a HIPAA violation or not. Nobody told us um, anything. Mm -hmm. Wow. Okay. So interesting. Natalie says, when I was talking about early, it was parents who say, I love you, but I don't love you being gay or trans. How can you love your kid if you don't love a major part of who they are? Do you love everything about yourself? Let's ask the question that way. Do we love everything about ourselves? Like, are we, are we the kind of people as a consciousness, like, do we, do I love everything about myself? No, is the answer. But I love myself. I don't love everything about myself, but I love myself, right? Like, I love the people in my life. I love my parents. Are you, like, I love my parents. I don't love that their religion keeps them from being closer to their kids, but I respect their beliefs. I love my parents. I don't love everything about them, right? I love myself. I don't love everything about myself. So your parents can love you and not love everything about you, even something as big as being gay or trans, right? I love myself. I have a great relationship with myself. I don't love everything about my body. I don't love everything about how my brain works. I don't love everything about me. But I love me. So I love my parents. I don't love everything about my parents. I love my siblings. Let me tell you, I do not love everything about my siblings. But I love them unconditionally. Forever. I do not love everything about them, though. You know? Alex says you can love someone's consciousness without loving every part of them. It can still hurt to not be fully seen, and that's valid. Exactly. 100% agree. 100% agree. You know? Now, uh, again, it's, it's really about how you love yourself is how you'll understand how to love other people. That's why people run away from themselves and I think do distract themselves with like, I'm gay, I'm trans, I'm Catholic, I'm Muslim. Yes, but if that's the biggest thing in your life, then you're not having a full relationship with your consciousness. As a queer kid who only read gay books after I moved out, who only went to gay clubs all of my 20s, who tried my hardest to just like wrap myself in my gayness, it was in the long run a disservice to my consciousness, but I needed it so badly. I needed that and I'm so glad I did it. No regrets. But when I went on a deeper journey with my introspection, my relationship with my consciousness, I know I am so much more because I am so many things together. I am so many parts together. So my gayness, so important to me. I wouldn't have married a person who didn't validate my queerness and didn't understand how important it is to me. Even though I'm a straight, we look straight presenting to the world, even though people will see us and they'll dismiss me as queer, because I ended up with a gamer boy, very pansexual of me, right? I understand. And that's a valid stereotype. <laughs> but obviously my queerness is still very important. But even my friends can't validate that all the time. Even other queer people invalidate my queerness because they don't see it as valid because I ended up with a gamer boy, right? People don't really see all of us. They still love us. 
I really believe that. So she went to Wyoming and were you able to connect with her at all? She went to Wyoming and she was in that facility for about a month. And we had a few phone calls while she was in my Wyoming. Um, nothing really eventful, but again, they, they were socially transitioning her and affirming her. So she was allowed to go by different names. She was allowed to have men's products. She was allowed to live as a boy in this facility in Wyoming, even though the whole time we're like, hey, not a, we're not okay with this. this See, this whole time, this hospital was gender affirming and treating my kid with more care than I could, and I'm upset about it. But they can't see it that way. They see this hospital treating this child with what they need as an affront or offense to their beliefs. And it is, by the way. This hospital absolutely doesn't give a fuck about your religious beliefs, and they shouldn't. Because your religious beliefs, your political beliefs, your beliefs are the direct harm caused to your child your religion like in my opinion should not be a reason that you can justify abusing your child in my opinion i don't think religion should allow you to justify abusing your child right but they don't see it that way and i think that that's the problem they keep thinking this hospital is discriminating against us you're discriminating against your own child goes against our wishes it goes against our beliefs um we were told pretty much well we do what the patient wants wow okay and you had no power to stop that or to change that none, none at all none of our wishes were respected or upheld or anything so then at that point after about a month in the acute psychiatric unit in wyoming she was transferred to a group home in billings montana and um Things have just never... Montana is a beautiful state, let me tell you. Again, we've we've constantly said, we, we don't want this to happen. You're socially transitioning her. We're not okay with this. And none of our wishes have been respected. She's allowed to have a chest binder. She was allowed to shave her head. Um, she's Ugh. allowed to wear all men's clothes. She's Ugh. in a therapeutic school setting, and she's allowed to be in the boys' groups in that school setting and uh, present herself as a boy also in that setting. Yeah, you're not winning me over, bro. This sounds like the state actually intervened and did what was right for your kid. It sounds like being in your household is the worst thing for your child. But this is where beliefs have conflict. This is why the world will never have world peace. Because we breed the people we are in conflict with. As a species, we breed the chaos. We cannot have world peace when we are breeding the next population we will be in conflict with. And so we have this. This is what it is. And in some ways, they're both kind of right. These parents get to live how they want, and I think they should have the right. And this kid gets to live how they want. I think they deserve that right. But we give birth to the, like, literally the community of people we would we will be in competition with. The group of people will complain about for ruining the country the group of people will like put all the blame on. I love that. Oh my goodness. Okay, so so that's where she is right now. She's in this group mm -hmm. home in Billings and she is out of your custody and I what is the 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 legal fight been like? I'm guessing you're represented by a lawyer. Like what's what's the fight look like right now? Do you want me to answer? Um when does a parent's beliefs supersedes a child? That's a great question. And honestly, if the parents could prove that their actions would bring less harm to the child, I think they could get their kid back. But right now, they're not proving that. So right now, they're doing everything in their power to prove that the child being put back in their home would cause more destruction to the child. So they would need to prove that the child would be better off in their home. And they're just not doing that. You know what I mean? Their child is the one who got the authorities involved. So the authorities, you know, for once the authorities got, you know, listen, there's never going to be a perfection to the system. How many kids slip through the system and go back to abusive homes and then die? Lots. How many kids are taken unjustly away from their parents? Lots. The system is not perfect. But in this specific case, it sounds like it's working. It sounds like the kid got taken away from a situation they didn't want to be put in. And the parents are reaffirming that that decision was correct with every interview they do, whether they believe it or not. 
not not good. We have court appointed attorneys on it, and um, they put a gag order on us, uh, making it even tougher to to fight this. They um, totally disable the parents' ability to fight for their. Hold on, Ari says I agree that it's possible to co- compart mentalize and love only parts of a person however when your parents love you conditionally like that can cause serious mental issues yes so hear me if you are loved conditionally then it's conditional if you love unconditionally that's different my parents love me unconditionally i know that they've proved that time and time again absolutely but you might have parents that love you conditionally. And in that circumstance, you get to negotiate the conditions. I love my parents unconditionally. We have a symbiotic relationship, okay? We have a symbiosis. So we both love each other unconditionally and both don't love parts of each other, but we both love each other unconditionally as a whole consciousness. So my situation is unconditional love. If your situation is conditional love, be conditional. That's a different game, girl. So pick yourself, pick your health, pick your joy always, even with the unconditional. But the game looks different. The relationship should look different. If your parents conditionally love you, be very, very strong with boundaries. And it is okay to absolutely remove yourself from that situation in a much more like, I don't even know who these people are, even if they're dying and old. Which, by the way, we'll go over. I have a TikTok to show you guys, okay? If your parents have never been there for you, your parents are people that love you conditionally, it is okay to not give a fuck what happens to them when they age out. But if you love your parents unconditionally, I think that's different. Then I would, you know what I mean? Then you could think about their retirement and maybe helping them through financial issues or maybe helping them in situations. Maybe. Not guaranteed. Okay? So just conditional love is different than unconditional parental rights, their freedom of speech and religion, it's all thrown right out. So with without being able to... Marcy says, why is she talking so much? It's not even her kid. I really don't like the step-parent hate in this chat, guys. There's two of you now. That's a lot. Do you guys not believe in step-parents? Maybe I'm just really lucky, but my dad is technically the step-parent to my two older brothers. And like, that's their dad, bro. That's the dad that stood up. That's the dad that raised them, that funded them. Like, I... Uh, Those are my brothers, bro. Do you guys not like step parents? Like, did you guys have the bad step parents? Because like bad step parents exist. I'm really lucky though. Like I have really good experiences with like parents who stepped up. Like men who literally married single moms and like were there for those kids and raised those kids. And those kids like walked down the aisle with those parents. So maybe you guys have like the bad step parent, but like that's their mom. Unless they don't have that relationship. You know what I mean? Like, do they not have that relationship? You know what I mean? Yeah, so I agree. Game says so many step parents are better than biological ones. I mean, literally. Biological ones usually, like, hello. You know, but I think, I guess it depends on your circumstance, right? If you have bad step parents, I could see that being an issue. But if you have good step parents, and it also depends on when the step parent came into their life. And some families operate where, like, even aunties and uncles have a say in how you're brought up. So it depends on the bubble circumstance, right? Yeah. I, I just think step parents and, and bio parents have the same probability of loving you or being shitty. I just don't see a difference. How many bio parents are ditching their kids constantly? Right? So like bio parent, how many bio parents are like abusing their kids? I just don't see there's a difference between step parents or bio parents. I think it's like the same. Right? That's like saying like this mom shouldn't talk if like she adopted somebody because like it's not their real parent. It just doesn't make sense to me. Right? So I, I, would, I just want to say that out loud. I don't know why her being a step parent matters. You know, to reach out to the to the press and online, there's no way to find anybody to help. But you guys have. Well, there's no one to help you because putting the child back in your home is probably going to impact the child in a worse way. You are you are doing interviews. We are. So um, we we have a lawyer in place that's challenging the gag order, um, but I can't really comment on legal stuff because I'm not a lawyer yeah. and I don't understand yeah. the the ins and outs of it. Um, but what what's been happening effectively is um, she's been socially transitioned yeah. against our wishes, and at this point, our family unit is destroyed. I mean, how do you bring someone? But you destroyed it. The parents—that's the problem. 
is the parents don't want to take responsibility for the fact that they destroyed their family unit. How do I know that? The freak says, how do you know that? Well, we know that because of the child. The child reached out to the authorities. The child was feeling suffocated. The child wanted to express, they already said, we're not going to validate our child's transition. Bam, you were admitting to a mentally abusing your child and not contributing to their health overall because your child is feeling impacted by this. If you in no way believe in transness as a possibility and your kid is literally trans, you are going to contribute more harm than good to your child. And then of course, like if your kid is even going through a, a stage and isn't even trans, you're still contributing to an issue enough that your kid reached out to authorities. Your, and the kid is also with their bio mom. So, okay. I'm back when you say she's been allowed to live as a boy for the last six months or so. And we were like, no, we're not doing that here. I mean, how do you come back from that? So there's that issue. And then yeah. there's the issue that um, on the 19th, we had a court mm -hmm. hearing where children's services wanted. I will say, um, Zen says, I believe stepfathers are statistically more likely to be sexual abusers than biological fathers. I think that is also like boyfriends. I think there is like a study that shows like women probably shouldn't date most men when raising children because like perfect setup for a predator. But also lots of good people step up and love kids that like they step up. So I think the dilemma of why that statistic is so high is because women will often like date lots of men and introduce them to their kids like without knowing them. And I think that's the problem. You know what I mean? In my opinion. So I think the statistics would change if people were more uh, cautious about who they brought into their child's lives. But I just don't think people people think about their children being abused by their boyfriends because they don't think like, why would a man date? Like, why else? You know what I'm saying? You know what I mean? So I, I, I agree. I think the studies do show that. But I think that is a get, that's because people are settling in their relationships and they're so desperate to be loved. And it's like there's so many things here. You know what I mean? Um... Okay. Out of the case. So they wanted to place with the birth mother in Canada and then just have the case dismissed and step out of it because they said, you know, they certainly don't want to violate our views and they, they don't really know what to do, but this is a new situation. And the judge ruled that they could not step out, but they would have temporary custody for up to six months and that they would place with the birth mother in Canada, which is another one of our fears that we're, we're having right now. Yeah, and in order to do that, there's a form that we're required to sign. Okay, hold on. I missed that. I just want to hear it again. About, but they would have temporary custody for up to six months and that they would place with a birth mother in Canada, okay. which is another one of our fears that we're, we're having right now. Yeah, and in order... What's wrong with the birth mother? Does she have problems? In order to do that, there's a form that we're required to sign that says we agree that we may never see her again forever. So. Well, you're not going to see him again because he is not going to want to have a relationship with transphobes unless he goes to therapy and learns like this is your journey and then he'll have a limited relationship with you because, yeah, like he's not going to want to see you as an adult anyways. And if he does want to see you, like you're welcome, but also will probably be very limited. Okay, so that's what the fight looks like right now. You don't, you don't have custody of your child. She is in Billings, Montana being... Um, she's wearing a chest binder, as you said. She shaved her head. She is being presented as a boy uh, named Leo. This all really happened in a matter of, it sounds like, four to five days in August when she was initially removed, moved to Wyoming, and then moved uh, to Billing. So in a matter of few months, because of what you think was a dispute over her quitting her summer job, her life yeah. has been, she doesn't realize it, but her life has been ruined in a lot of ways. Wait, did I hear that wrong? Are they saying like the the now the child is rebelling because they made them quit their summer job? Ways not saying there's no chance of redemption because I what? pray and believe Correct. that there is. But I mean, what? right now, like your I, I mean your life and your family has been completely demolished because of mm -hmm. a child probably just resenting her parents temporarily as we all did as teenagers over some right. oh they're so delusional oh they're so delusional even if this is a temporary rebellion it doesn't matter they handled it badly they handled it badly I mean, extremely temporary and the state is saying yes we have the authority to do this wow
<laughs> yeah, she's lost so her grandparents, her cousins, her 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 whole family is pretty much removed. Her sister says it's Sister Tara that really loves her. And they're, they've already court ordered or CPS has ordered that there's no contact there either. So it's amazing. And so right. tell me so about she, this. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Game says, I'm assuming the interviewer is misgendering to keep the parents cooperating. Nope. The person interviewing them is a conservative and doesn't believe in LGBT people. She doesn't believe in trans. None of these people believe in trans people that we're watching. We are watching conservatives talk about this. None of them believe in trans people and just uh jordan peterson also interviewed the parents they don't believe in trans kids none of these people believe in trans people that's why the kid doesn't want to be with them that's why they're with their birth mom i'm assuming the birth mom is going to encourage the gender affirm uh, affirmation and also since the parents are divorced it could be lots of reasons why the kid decided to live in america not canada or whatever else happened i don't know if the mom has problems but like the parents obviously have problems so it's like okay I was just going to say, so she's effectively cut off of our Whole our family. family unit. You know, all of her cousins, her aunts and uncles, her grandparents, all of that. Yeah, but why? Because are they all transphobes? And like, do they not, does the does Leo not want to talk to his family because you all are going to misgender him? Like, or, you know what I'm saying? Or if he reaches out to his cousins, are they all going to like be cool with it? You know what I mean? Mm. And tell me about this possibility of her moving in with her biological mother in Canada. Okay, so this hasn't happened yet. Oh, this is a month ago. I wonder, I think it's happened now. Ooh, okay. The current court order. Yeah, and, and it's concerning to us because... Um, this interview is a month old, just FYI. There is a, a history of the, the children that we had in our care saying that, you know, this was an abusive situation when, when the birth mother was involved. And I've given that document to CPS, all of those documents, and their their attitude is, well, that's not really what's going on now. That might have been in the past, so we're not going to worry about it. So we do have some what concerns that are legitimate about. Yeah, but they're abusing their kids. See, so there's abuse in both homes. So this kid is fucked either way. They either come home to an abusive conservative parent or they go be abused in Canada. But what's the abuse that was happening in Canada? Canada. We also have some concerns. You know, there's a form that Canadian immigration wants you to sign that says you agree that you may be permanently separated from your child and never see them again. So in in a sense, they're asking us to sign away our rights and say that we'll never talk to her or see her again if she goes to Canada. Oh, my goodness. And so they said to you, um, cause this is a quote from you, I believe we were told that letting Jennifer transition and live as a boy was in her quote, therapeutic best interest. And because we weren't willing mm -hmm. to follow that recommendation, the court gave CFS custody of Jennifer for six months. That's what's happened. Correct. Yes. yes. In fact, um, we knew that was coming when they sent the guardian ad litem to our house prior to that, because the guardian ad litem seen our house. We had a pleasant conversation with her. Everything was great. Until she said, um, are we, um, how's it going to look in our house raising uh, a transgender child that do we agree to call her by her preferred pronouns and raise her as a boy? And she said, if we don't agree to that, then she's not we're not going to like what she's got to say in court. OK, about wow. us. So, yeah. they also provided us with an article. I can send it into your show yeah. that, you know, the guardian at litem was taking the stance of, well, she she wants to be a boy and we need to advocate for what she wants yeah. and again like our, our rights as parents to say no you're you can't be a boy um let's work through this again and, and more counseling and things like that those rights have been totally diminished and taken away yes yeah. have. and then it's it's um also coming from the cps and the attorney they've assigned to her they they come at us like criminalizing our love for our child and our parental for wanting to maintain our parental rights and to protect our daughter's future, but they're criminalizing that. Oh my goodness. I mean, they don't get it, bro. It's not computing. Like it's not hitting their brains. That's not hitting their brains. They're literally making the case. It's okay. It's like, they're not even good at faking. That's what I mean. That's how I know they're authentic in a way. They, they're not even smart enough to pretend they're going to be pro-trans, capture the kid and then torture them the way they want to. They're literally saying, like, I don't understand what the problem is. Yeah, of course, we're not going to gender our child correctly. And of course, we're going to misgender them and mentally torch them. What do you mean? Like, they don't even know. Right. Like, they don't even know 
to lie and pretend like, sure, yeah, 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 we'll call, yeah, Leo, we love that name, Leo. So it's kind of sweet that they don't even know, like, to lie, that's good, that's probably a good sign, but they're so dumb in the nicest way possible. See how I love everybody who's dumb? They're so dumb. They don't even know that the reason you're not getting your kid back is because you literally keep admitting you're going to keep abusing them mentally. <laughs> but because they don't think it's abuse, because they don't think being trans is real, they can't process it as abuse. This is why parents will never admit they abused you as a kid because they don't even know they're abusing you as most people don't believe that they don't even know it either. You know what I mean? Ari says at this point, have they explained at all why they don't want him to transition? Because they're Christian, because they're religion, because they don't think it's real. They don't think being trans is a real thing. Even the host agreed being trans is not a real thing. You know what I mean? And um, why would they say that your daughter could move in with uh, her biological mom in Canada? From my understanding, she has not only not had a relationship with her for many years, but um, that her biological mother really mistreated her in the time that they were together, mm. correct? Well, the statute states that um, I'm not a lawyer, so I'm, I'm explaining it the, to the best of my understanding. Mm -hmm. There's a statute, and I don't know if it's in Montana only or, or across the board with everywhere, but it states that if there are two parents, you know, birth, biological parents, which would be Todd and, and the birth mother, and you want to take the child away from one set of parents, that you have to place them with their other biological parent if that person mm. is available. Hmm. Yeah, and there's no dispute between us and, and um, her biological mother. The, um, the whole the whole thing with uh, CPS flat out um, ignoring to even do a, a house check in Canada, those kind of things. And we don't uh, suspect a lot there. That's. Uh, but our point yeah. is, is that. The from what I understand, the two agencies yeah. don't communicate. So yeah. Children's Services in Canada and Children's Services in the United States, they're not agencies that communicate or even have the same policies or anything like mm -hmm. that. So to send her somewhere where you haven't even seen the house or... Yeah, Ania, I want to know too. Okay, but like what did the bio mom do? Because right now we know what they've done and we know that if the kid goes back to them, he's going to get mentally tortured. But what did the bio mom do? She probably did something. I want to know what it is. And then here's the conundrum. If they if if Leo gets to go with his bio mom, he has a better chance of being at least trans and doing his own thing. Even if the bio mom like isn't the greatest mother, it, that's the question. If they're both shitty parents, even though I think these parents are trying their best, you know what I mean? It's just not good enough for a trans kid. It's not going to be good enough for a queer kid. It's not going to be good enough for an LGBT kid because they don't believe in the validity. So I'm trying to think like I guess if I was Leo. I would think which set of parents are going to give me the best ability to have the best chance at life. And it's probably with his bio mom, but I don't know if that's true because I don't know what she's done. They keep alluding to something, but what is it? Or anything? How how have you investigated that that's a safe place? Yeah, the, the whole reason they're doing that, though, is her birth mother is calling her by her preferred pronouns and is doing exactly oh. what the court wants. Okay, so the mom is pro-trans you know, agreeing to raise her as a boy and all of that. So, right. So and I don't know if I'm sorry. It, it's, it's a, sometimes it's a little bit hard with, uh, with zoom to not talk over each other. Go ahead. I didn't mean to interrupt. Oh no, we're, we're just saying like they're, they're advocating for her to be able to live as a boy as she wants. And her birth mother is willing to support that when we are not. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Mm, yeah. Well, right. And I, I don't know if, How do they not get it? How do they not understand what's happening? How do they not understand what's... Yeah, exactly. But what did the mom do that they think... Is that the only reason they don't want Leo with his bio mom? You know what I mean? Why didn't the bio mom... Like, what was the issue with the bio mom before? See, now I don't believe them. I can't believe anything they say because they don't even understand the situation. Of course the court is going to send Leo to be with his bio mom if his bio mom is willing to support his transition what if you guys want to give comment on this if you don't want to but in the original report that i saw from redux they uh, reviewed a counseling report that i okay 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 
could not recall a single instance of feeling loved or nurtured by biological mother, described witnessing almost daily incidents of domestic violence and arguing between bio father, bio mother that often ended in bio biological mother hitting father, throwing objects at him, smashing, breaking household items, describes biological mother's behavior as crazy. Also described incidents of violence directed at older siblings. One seeing her biological mother throw that sibling against the fridge after becoming enraged at her for wearing a necklace that belonged to her mother without permission. Described incidences where a biological mother would punch, hit, slap, kick, and her siblings when her, when, I'm going to say her because it's Leo, but it's him. Their biological mother would become enraged, describing hearing biological mother scream obscenities at older siblings, calling her cunt, binge, and whore. Stated her biological mother worked at home. Described the work as being on the computer, talking with set men about sex. Oh, is mom a sex worker? At times when we see the computer screen, which was not located in a private area of the home, described what she believed animated figures on the screen performing sex acts on each other. Okay, so it sounds like mom is a sex worker with mental health problems. So it sounds like both households suck. So it sounds like both households suck. Abusive sex worker mom could end up giving Leo more of a chance, but also be worse off. Hmm. Which one's better? Would it be better for Leo to go to the state? Oh, the state sucks. Ooh, has bio mom gotten therapy since? Good point, Caitlin. Has mom, bio mom gotten diagnosed, is on medication, and is actually more stable? Ooh, good point. Discord says this poor kid, all the adults suck and they're suffering. I know, this sucks. The kid is fucked. It's like all the parents in their life suck, bro. Can we get a confirmation on that, please? Yeah, okay. Obviously, we want a confirmation on this, too. I think that you guys offered describing the relationship between Jennifer and her biological mother and the treatment that her biological mother um, showed her, showed her sibling, that apparently there was a lot of both emotional and physical abuse from her biological mother. And I mm. imagine that plays a part in the concern of her, uh, the mother getting custody of your daughter, right? Um, we don't we have no idea what goes on in their home because it's been over seven years. So we really can't comment on that. There's um, mm. we've had Leo is 14 for people asking communication with them. And it's been it was positive. So um, Thomas says the fact that we have to calculate where he'd be less suicidal is crazy to me. A state worker has that choice, by the way. So, yeah, we basically have to do that. Ooh, can he be emancipated? Ooh, that might be better for him. But 14 is so young. Emancipated at 14? That's so young. This is really difficult. And by the way, he's being socially transitioned. We're not even doing medical transition. We're just talking about social transition right now. The kid has not been medically transitioned. You know? Ooh, Ania says, are there any LGBT resources in the area? Like a halfway house. Damn, this is going to suck either way, bro. Halfway houses, government. Like, this just sucks. Leo got dealt a shitty hand. Let me tell ya. Let me tell ya. It might be better for him to be with the conservative parents in the long run if he can meditate his way into like handling their bullshit could also cause a lot of damage in the long run. The sex worker mom could end up causing a lot of physical damage in the long run, which is obviously very bad. But ooh, like, oh, this just sucks. This just sucks. We can't really comment that way. I don't think we are concerned. That is one of our concerns. But um, I'm hesitant to just keep throwing rock. We don't know what yeah. goes on in their house, you know? And so my, our intentions aren't to throw her under the bus or anything right now, but there, there's issues. So is there a chance she's better then? Because if the mom was that bad, why wouldn't you throw her under the bus? You know what I mean? I'm wondering if she's better or if it was exaggerated for some reason. Hmm. Is that we're concerned about that we want checked out? Yeah, this is. Does that make sense? Yeah, that that yeah, that definitely makes sense. And I understand uh, maybe not wanting to comment on the details of that. I think Redox was uh, report. Lakara says, do you really not see the social contingent aspect of the trans people that's happening in the West lately? The number of trans kids has skyrocketed. I don't believe they're all legit. Who cares if they're legit or not? You have the right to ponder your gender. Right? Like, yeah, there's going to be an uptick of kids who aren't sure if they're trans or gay or straight or cis. There's going to be an uptick of adults who don't know if they're trans or gay or cis. Lots of people don't even realize things about themselves. That's why they have midlife crises until way later in life. That doesn't matter. These parents don't even want their kid contemplating that they're trans. That's the problem. It's not the problem that they might not actually be trans, right? Because socially transitioning, like, who fucking cares? 
You know, you want to be called a different name? Who fucking cares? All people change their names all the time. Half my friends went by their middle names. A name doesn't matter. A name is what makes you feel good about yourself. Nobody cares. Okay. If you're concerned about medical transitioning, I would trust the doctors that you have trust in, right? I don't care that there's an uptick in trans kids or uptick in people exploring the possibility that may be something they didn't know they were. Great. My concern, okay, is that these people don't even want their child to even contemplate uh, like the possibility because they don't believe in trans people. That's the dilemma. You can't explore freely if your parents want you to end up with the, a certain response. That's not how it works. Porting on a counseling report that Jennifer had apparently told a counselor that there had been some very disturbing incidents of different kinds of physical and emotional abuse, name calling by Christine, her biological mother. So I think it's just safe to say that there Correct. are concerns and questions, especially Correct. when yes. someone is in another country and is. No, I haven't heard of Aaron Friday, Erica. I don't know who that is affirming quote unquote of a child's desire to be the opposite sex I think it is um it's sufficient to say that there are simply some concerns absolutely yes and so um mm -hmm. how did this travel to the media because I only heard about this story this week and so uh how has that developed this is a legal issue not a Christian issue um yeah. So even from the legal perspective, let's say this was a secular couple that was doing the same thing. I think that kid should still have the right to say that their secular parents are like mentally torturing them if that's what it feels like. And the parents are admitting they're going to mentally torture their kid. I mean, they are literally like that's not their intention, but that's what's going to happen. You know what I mean? So when did about a uh, before our January 19th court hearing, Todd and I felt that we were absolutely at a loss and we had no avenues and no one was listening to us and no one was helping. So we made a video that we released on YouTube that was about 17 minutes long that just explained our situation and, and how we had gotten to where we were and how um, we believed that on that Friday, the 19th, they were going to take custody from us, which did happen. So we released this video and um, people started to see it and it, it just has kind of taken off from there. Mm -hmm. Yes, and some of the people that commented on it were actual lawmakers in Montana that said, hey, they're not following the laws we passed. They're doing this backward right in the comments on the video. Mm -hmm. And we did not use our daughter's name in the in the video whatsoever. Mm -hmm. There was nothing inappropriate in any way. So, so what happens next? Um. Honestly, I'm not super sure. Um, hmm. I, I know that there's more hearings coming up and, and what are the results of those hearings? I don't know. Okay. And so basically you just have... Lakara says, I guess I would agree, but I can't help... Uh, he's talking to Elena. But I can't help thinking of cases I heard where therapists and doctors and teachers encourage transitions without the parents' knowledge. Listen, every situation will happen. There's going to be people that convince your kids to transition when they're not trans. I have so many bad therapist stories from friends. I have friends who went to therapists that after one session tried to convince them that their dad was like a, a molester. And I'm like, what? They didn't even know you. You watch Till Swan and she does those weird seances where she convinced people their parents molested them. People are crazy. They're just crazy. I just saw a, t a TikTok by Ray William Johnson of a doctor wanting to do insurance fraud and convinced 500 patients they had cancer and made them go through chemo so he could make millions of dollars off of it. Yes, bad things will happen because bad people exist or humans will do what they think is right. All these people think they're right. That's the irony. All these humans are like, you know what's a good idea? I'm going to scam 500 people and convince them they have cancer so I can get the insurance money. And he did it. So yes bad shit's going to happen in the world, but you are absolutely in some way contributing to it going south in this case. This couple is contributing to the fact that their child didn't come back home to them because they keep literally saying they are not going to validate their child in any capacity in relation to being trans. Why would the court put the kid back in that home when the kid is saying I have suicidal ideations because my family's home uh, tr transphobic? Right. So, again, if these parents really wanted their kid to come home, they would say, fine, I don't get what's happening. I don't like it, but we would rather have you at home and we would rather love you. than have you go away. So we'll figure this out. 
and then figure it out. And then their kid could run away again or something like that. If the kid, if they didn't promise to actually like pay attention to the kid's needs. So again, like you can hear as many bad cases as you want. There's always going to be a story out there, right? There's always going to be a story out there of a person who wanted to be religious and they thought it was the right decision and they ended up like committing suicide later because they couldn't handle it. Everyone is going to have a relationship with like good and bad stories. All things are happening. In this particular case, though, the parents are admitting on every interview I've seen from them that they are, yes, going to deny their child their trans affirming like care. Which means that the court now has to say, OK, if I put this kid back in this home, is this kid going to kill itself? Himself. Is the kid going to kill himself? Because then if the kid kills himself, the court is like the court failed the kid. The court will have failed this child if this child kills himself after going back home to these conservative parents. And then the conservative parents would have failed their kid by not being the parents who could have at least met their kid halfway. So everyone's in a tough spot. Do we put this kid with the bio mom that might be crazy? The conservative parents that might actually encourage a real suicide? The system that might end up like taking more advantage of this kid? This situation is fucked is the conclusion to go through the legal process and the hope is that you the hope is that you regain custody correct and that you're able to try to put things back together that's our hope and um you know we're never going to stop fighting for her and for what we think is right and the system has destroyed our family unit the the way that it was there'll never be you know our unit will never be whole or never be right again So we feel like the only choice that we have at this point is to get the word out so that this doesn't happen to another family. I mean, in Montana, you think you're safe. You you think that there's certain things that go on out there that you're kind of in a bubble and safe. And what did she say? You're kind of in a bubble and you're safe. Yeah, but your trans kids aren't safe. She's right. She is safe in that bubble. Straight people are safe in that bubble. You know who's not safe in that bubble? Trans kids. She's right. Isn't that funny how we all know we're in a bubble, but she doesn't get that she's in a bubble that her kid can't survive in? Isn't that beautiful, bro? Is my work not fucking peak? Is my fucking work not fucking peak? She just said it out loud. We're safe in this bubble. Yeah, straight people are for sure safe. Cis people, for sure safe. Trans people, trans kids, trans questioning children. Not so safe. But she doesn't give a fuck about that, does she? Because people think when they say they're safe in that bubble, that means they're safe to control people to be like them. And you can't do that, dude. Your kid isn't you. Your kid is their own person. That's not what happened. Um, We could even point to the governor, I believe, released a tweet on our story. And um, I call it word soup. It doesn't really say anything. And um, I don't know if you've seen that tweet or not. Yes, I did. And I thought that it was, whether you call it word soup or word salad or <laughs> whatever it is, yeah, it didn't really say anything. It certainly was not the strength that I think a lot of us were hoping to see from especially a Republican governor, yeah. which I guess is exactly why you're in the situation that you're in. So I have interviewed, um, I think you might be the third or fourth set of parents that I've interviewed in a similar situation. And you're right. It's all over the country that this is happening. What message would you give to parents who find themselves in a similar circumstance? I I would say, I don't think CPS is there to help you and your child. They're not. Um, you, You know, they walked into a house where there was clearly no abuse, clearly a loving home. And they took. Interesting. Uh, The New York Post, who, by the way, is owned by Murdoch, I had a feeling I was researching it yesterday for the story on the soldier. And I was like, why do I feel like the New York Post isn't what it used to be? And I was like, oh, it's owned by Murdoch, who did Fox News. So just FYI, the bias in the reporting is going to be there as it is in everything. Montana Paris say they lost custody of their of their daughter after opposing 14 year olds transition. So they show a little bit of the kid. Look at the kid has purple hair. The kid has uh, dyed hair. Lakara membership six months. Let's go, Karosha Gang. My gender is female. Please remember. Let's go, Lakara. She's a queen. Lakara, you're a queen. Okay, look at this. Like, 
Oh, Lakara, I always forget you're a girl for some reason. I got into my head you're a boy and I just misgendered you earlier. You're so right. Why do I do that? I got it in my head. See how hard it is to switch it? Okay. Lakara's a girl. I imagine you a tall Croatian girl. Croatian girls be tall here, bro. I imagine you're seven feet tall, girl. I'm now imagining you blonde, seven feet tall with Croatian legs. I'm so sorry, girl. I'm so sorry I misgendered you. Um, okay, so the child, yeah, the child has like dyed hair. The parents are kind of, it's interesting. They're kind of chill in that sense. Okay, I want to know who's this? They reviewed the case. Who's this? Okay, this is the governor. Okay, so this is the governor. Okay. Upon hearing recent allegations related to a child welfare case, I asked Lieutenant Governor Kristen, whatever, Juarez, an experienced attorney, cons constitutional conservative mother and grandmother to review it. Consulting with the director of DPHHS and personally examining case documents, Lieutenant Governor Juarez was has concluded that DPHHS and the court have followed state policy and law in their handling of this tragic case. I've asked the Lieutenant Governor to continue monitoring the case as it progresses. Okay. Further, Senate Bill 99, which I signed into law on April 2023, prohibits medical and surgical treatments to treat minors with gender dysphoria and also prohibits the use of taxpayer resources for such treatment. Our administration will uh, advance, will continue to advance policies that strengthen our family and protect Montana's kids. Like what we have done to promote adoption and to ban permanent invasive life-altering medical procedures on children, life puberty blockers, oh, like puberty blockers, hormonal treatments, and sex reassignment surgeries. Okay. I like how people are mad at him for not like having a stronger stance, like because he's like following the law. You got everyone is so pussy, bro. Okay, he's just following the law, bro. Again, you're not paying attention. If this kid gets back, put back in this home, there is a chance that the child unalives themselves, right? Hello? Hello? Now, of course, there's a chance the child doesn't unalive themselves, and that's the hope. But we have no guarantee of that since the child reached out to authorities on their own because, you know, they reached out to the right people to get them taken out of their parents' home because that's what they wanted. So it's like the parents aren't, like, uber strict. They have, like, dyed hair and interesting aesthetic. Like, look at the mama's purple hair, okay? So they're not, like, that conservative, but they're obviously, because they're Christian, they have to be anti-trans, right? Um, Izzy says, so if we see neurodivergent kids transitioning often as well, how much do their conditions, autism, ADHD, and OCD play a role in their suicidal suicidality outside of the gender issue? Mm. I will say this. A lot of neurodivergent people I know do not identify very strongly with their gender. And I actually think like if you don't identify very strongly with your gender, you're probably even more of a candidate to have fun with your gender, right? And I think that that's kind of cool. Again, I think people have the right to explore their gender, but I think children, okay, this child has tried over and over again to speak to their parents, to be understood, and the parents continually do not want to hear their child. So I kind of feel like... Why don't they understand that? Why are they answering wrong? Like, why don't they even know? They're so sweet. They don't even know how to lie to pretend they would. Re they don't even. It's not like they're evil and they want their kid back. They literally think they're doing the right thing. If they were evil parents, they'd be like, oh, yeah, we're going to we're going to we love Leo, bro. He's like our favorite son, bro. And then when Leo gets back at home, they torture the fuck out of him. But they don't even want to do that. It's even more like less. That's what I'm saying. There's not even a maliciousness. They're just like, yeah. We don't like trans people because we don't think it's real and we love our kid and we hope to help them through this illness they're experiencing. And I'm like, damn, damn, that's so interesting, you know? So again, like peace and love to the religious, but you guys are not fucking helping your cases, bro. Took things and they twisted it. So I would be very careful, know your rights, get legal representation. As and you have to think about this when you have a child. You do. You need to think about this when you have a child. You know what I mean? Because that's the thing that I don't think people are understanding. When you have a child, they might not like the bubble you raise them in. And it might be the worst thing for them. As soon as possible. Don't stop asking questions. Don't stop telling people if you're not happy about something. 
by by being silent, you know, like if you're not happy about something and then you're quiet about it, you're teaching them that that behavior is okay when it's not. Yep. Yep. Unfortunately, and I think so many people have had the same mentality as you, that you have nothing to hide. So you let CPS into your house. You allow your child to talk to CPS. I totally understand. It's not about CPS, you dumb fucks. You're literally doing it now on this story. You were admitting, I don't know, I'm just repeating it now because I'm, it's just like my brain twitches like this. This is what I mean. Like you don't even know, it's not about letting CPS into your home. You're admitting it on this stream. If CPS never came to your house and you admitted this on stream, like what are we talking about? Understand making those decisions as people who are very confident in the home that you've built, the safety that you've given to your child. But unfortunately, the more access from what I've seen that you give CPS, the more information that they use and try to weaponize against you, even if it requires them to completely twist the facts of a situation. So... Izzy says, what if they think this of the suicide issue from the other end, like allowing them to transition increases their risk of suicide? Not sure if that makes sense. I think it makes great sense. And I think that that could be an argument they could use. But since they're not using it, um, I don't even think they're thinking about it. They think so. They said earlier they think the suicide attempt was a call like an not real. They said their child's suicide attempt was a, a, a call for attention. Like they wanted attention and it's true. Their kid did want attention. The kid doesn't want to die. Leo does not want to kill himself. Leo doesn't want to die. He, he literally feels trapped. He feels like he's going to be pushed because he's having suicidal ideations. And the parents think that it's all for attention. It is for attention. Pay attention to me. If you do not care for me the way I need, I feel like my brain is going to explode and I'm going to have to die. Yes, exactly, exactly. Pay attention. Leo doesn't want to die. Leo is trying to save his own life because none of the adults in his life give a fuck about his life. He is trying to keep himself alive. And adults around him keep putting him in a situation where he's feeling driven to think about unaliving himself. Whether or not the attempt was his way of just getting around the legal system to be freed from his parents, without a doubt, it's obviously impacting his mental health. If he wasn't being impacted, why would he have done what he did? If he isn't being impacted by living in this environment, why would he have done these things? Now, again, there could be a chance he could have serious like psycholo psychological jam uh, uh, damage and be like like born evil. Get a psycho like get a therapist to evaluate him and see if that's true. But as of right now, it is looking like it is simply a kid who feels like they're trans and they would like to be reaffirmed in that and not being reaffirmed in that seems to be doing more harm than less. If you can get him examined by enough therapists, enough people without enough, the problem is even therapists are biased because they're humans. If you go to a therapist, some of them will just reaffirm your bullshit. Those are bad therapists. Go to a therapist that will get you into, to become a better version of yourself. But since everyone is so biased, it's hard. These own parents are so biased, they can't even possibly think their kids are going to be different, you know, than who they are. So again, like, I don't know why we're all pretending like we live in this perfect world. We're like, oh my God, people, you know, like, hello, ma'am. As awful as it is and as sad as it is, I do hope that somehow this story is used to, um, to help other people parents and to and I hope so yes too. and that yeah. is our goal and that is our our hope like we we understand like I said our unit is destroyed yeah. but we can only god they're such doomers bro it's you destroyed it and also it's not even destroyed bro just call your kid up and be like hey we were assholes our bad and see if your kid by the way your kid doesn't bro hope now that by getting the word out that this will help other parents and you'll know what to look out for and be aware of when things that, we, you know, we have hindsight right now, and but it's not helping. Okay, final question. How can people best support you? We do have a Give, Send, Go where we're trying to raise money um, for, so we don't have to use public defenders who are a part of the system and in bed with CPS. Um, we're not trying to throw our... Yeah, Discord says helping parents and not the kids. See how they're all focused on helping the parents and not the kids? Cool public defenders under the bus but we don't feel that we've been listened to and we've been helped okay 
Oh my goodness. God. Okay, this is the section where she gives her thoughts. I'm just curious about them. Gosh. What a horrifying nightmare. Literally parents' worst nightmare. I don't know anything more dystopian and more wicked than this. And there are so many lessons I think we can glean from their story. Uh, one, and this is not me victim blaming because I do think the parents absolutely are the victims here. Their child is the victim here. And so uh, hindsight is twenty i I'm just saying what I'm about to say as someone who has interviewed parents like this and who has seen these kinds of stories over and over again. This is not me trying to condemn. It's just the truth. Our kids do not need to be on social media. They don't need to have smartphones. And I know that they had put mechanisms in place, as you heard, to make sure that she wasn't seeing things that she wasn't supposed to see. But kids are very technologically. See how she's still convinced this kid is being influenced by social media, which is like, again, you only see this as a negative if the kid goes in a direction you don't like. But why don't you want your kid to go in this direction? Because they're trans. No other reason. The kid isn't bad. They literally said the kid was smart. They said Leo was good at school, that Leo was bullied since third grade. You don't think it's weird your kid was bullied since third grade? Guys, not everybody was bullied. I don't know if you know this. It's very interesting that kids get bullied. It, though bullying seems to be universal, it's really not. Not all people get bullied, guys. Why is your kid being bullied in the third fucking grade? Something is different about them, right? And something they're not getting care for. It's like the kid is probably neurodivergent, right? Some sort of something. I'm telling you right now, these parents are not equipped to handle their, or to help their child. Proficient these days. They're even savvier than parents. Um, and so we have to be extremely vigilant to protect our kids from those things. And I know that uh, teenagers, I remember doing the same thing to my parents. We all did in one way or another. You try to shame your parents into allowing you to do more things than they want you to do. All my friends are doing it. All my friends have smartphones. All my friends have TikTok accounts, whatever it is. And so you have to let me do this. And especially a child who had been bullied, who had been excluded. I think that's even more difficult for parents of that child because you want so badly for your child to find happiness and inclusion and acceptance somewhere. So it can be really persuasive when the child says, look, I'm just so unhappy in my real life. Can you at least let me find some happiness and inclusion virtually? I don't know if that's what happened in the situation, but I can imagine that it's very difficult. I can sympathize with that, that it's difficult for parents in that position, especially if the parents are part of a generation where they were not raised with social media and smartphones and things like that. We just underestimate the danger and the predation that's out there. I have heard that over and over again. The same story, so sadly, that kids who felt excluded, felt bullied for whatever reason, they were different, maybe they were what some people would call nerdy or dorky, or they just didn't care about the fashion trends or doing the same things that the cool kids were doing. Yeah, uh, Manawar says, does she think being trans makes you fit in more? These people literally think being queer and trans makes you fit in more because they don't understand that queerness is still a subculture of the norm. They still do not, they do not understand that queer people are a minority. They literally think people like fake autism to fit in, but they only are fitting into their subcategories of subcultures. Yes, you can fake being queer, fake being neurodivergent to fit into a bubble that will welcome you, but it's not the norm. They literally think this is the norm. It's not. It's small little niche communities. All of our communities are small little niche communities, right? She doesn't understand like the disadvantages, but also if her kid is already in bubbles, if the, wait, not her kid. That's not her kid. If Leo is already in bubbles where he's exploring transness, that means he already is that kid in that bubble. I have brothers. None of them are interested in exploring transness. Right. And if they are, that means they are have a, like, uh, I think even Mark at one time, my gay brother did say like, oh, my God, am I a woman? And I think like that's normal for queer kids to ask themselves those questions. He's gay. But like, you know, and we all ask ourselves those questions like, oh, my God, are we like trans or gay? Like, are what are we like? What are we doing? But that means we already have a proclivity in that direction. Or maybe some of the neurodivergent people might ask themselves, hey, what's my relationship with gender? But that means you're already on the spectrum that even allowed you the possibility of going down that pathway. So many people are not going to have the experience of ever even thinking, am I one of these things? But if it does happen, it just means they became a category of person that allowed that possibility. And it, whether it's a movie they saw or a person who said something or something like, 
I guarantee you there are going to be kids right now who see this, like parents right now who see this story on her podcast and realize, I think I might be trans. I'm dead serious. It doesn't matter in what way you are exposed to something. Once you have the idea in your head of like, can I be this thing? Can I do this? I remember reading books. I remember seeing like paintings of old Victorian paintings, like sort of in the nude and like beautiful paintings. And I remember thinking like, is this a life I can have? It doesn't matter what your kids are exposed to, right? It matters that like, regardless of how the thought comes into their head, it might open up an opportunity for them in the same way it does for adults. Now, of course, you want to consume certain things at an appropriate age to understand the context of it in a more thorough way. And that's a different conversation, right? But so many people as adults have midlife crises and think, oh my God, I want to do something different with my life. So again, like the fact that they aren't even open to the fact that people can be trans or gay is fine, but you don't get to control what your kids experience is. You can only be there as parent to guide them in a direction But if you keep your kids feeling tortured and misunderstood and suffocated, not only are your kids not going to have relationships with you, but you're probably contributing to like a negative, a negative thing in their life. You know what I mean? To the harm, you know? So again, like with peace and love, we don't even have information on these things to even know. Like when I was growing up, I didn't even know like there were different, like autism was actually a spectrum. Like, I always thought just autism meant one thing. I didn't even know it was a spectrum. The the idea that autism was a spectrum was not a concept in my bubble growing up. And now I'm like, oh, it's like a spectrum, right? So again, everyone's going to have a relationship with it. Even non-binary, gender fluid. I go back and forth on terminology as well, just because it's like, well, how are we defining it? Because words are constructs. Well, then I'm this thing. If you're defining it this way, that's what I am. Right. Or if you're if this is the relationship you're having with this language, then, yeah, that that that's a good like that's a good way to describe me. It's like, what are words? Words are only things that allow you to make sense of something. So if somebody sees me and my husband and goes, oh, Brittany's straight. Sure. Okay. Oh, Brittany's married to a man. Sure. But if you asked us what's our internal relationship with those things, well, that's a different answer. But also it doesn't matter. Because it's about us, not about how the world perceives us, except when we're playing the game of how the world perceives you, you know? And that's the thing that they don't understand is they think you are what you are perceived as. But that's not how it works. You know what I mean? That's only how it works socially, you know? Um, it is what it is. Anyways, let's see if there's anything interesting here. Whatever. Um, they just feel different. Daisy strong in sat on my couch and basically said the same thing. She felt different. She was- is Daisy that detransitioner? Because I've watched her videos. She had a baby, which is great. And I'm glad people feel that way. But again, just because a detransitioner exists doesn't mean a trans person doesn't ex- exist. Trans people that hate detransitioners are just as annoying to me as detransitioners that hate trans people. You all are having your own experience. Leave everybody alone. But you can't. Because you think them existing invalidates your existence because that's how people use it against you. Don't use people's experience against you. Don't use people's experience against yourself. That is their experience. Honor your experience, right? And then decide, is this healthy or not? And that will lead you closer to your joy, right? You know, you don't just find out you're trans and then you're happy. I have a great podcast on this. You know, trans isn't going to make you joyful. It's not being like proud. You're something is going to make you joyful. You know what makes you joyful? Having a full, whole rounded, introspective relationship with your consciousness. That is a different game. It's why cis people aren't joyful just because they're born cis. Because cisness isn't their whole life. Same with trans people. Your whole life isn't being trans. Right? Because people transition all the time. They're like, why aren't I fully happy? Well, don't worry. Most cis people aren't fully happy either. Let's talk about joy. Let's talk about joy. You know? I wasn't sure why she felt different, but she felt... Oh, yeah. Good point. Sorry. Nick says the interviewer has no thought or compassion about for how Leo feels or how he would react to seeing this segment where she undermines and misportrays him. She's just using Leo for her own selfish agenda. This whole podcast, nothing had anything to do with, the, with Leo. All of it was how the parents were suffering, how the parents were victims, how the parents... Which is fine. 
But obviously why Leo doesn't feel comfortable in this home. Not one part of this podcast was about Leo and how Leo felt. It was simply about dismissing Leo because, quote, they know him better than he knows himself. Which, yeah, maybe Leo's a girl, bro. Maybe he's going to come out and say, actually, I I'm not a guy. Cool. But I hope you get parents that let you explore that. It'd be better for parents to allow their kids to explore it than for parents to be like, I know you better than you know yourself. You don't. You can't even explain it. You can't even understand it in this podcast. I just listened to you for a full hour and you just couldn't get it, you know? Different. And then to find some kind of acceptance, some kind of community, they get online. They go on Tumblr. They go on Reddit. Tumblr. And then they're met by a bunch of other kids, a lot of times not kids, a lot of times young adults who have also felt different. And sure. they finally feel like, wow, other people out there like me. These, yeah. They feel different too. They were not cool. They were not accepted. They were not cheerleader. Okay. My bad. Sorry. I can become friends with these people online. And what happens is a lot of those people have convinced themselves and then go on to convince other people that, well, the reason that you've been excluded, the reason that you've never felt fully comfortable and confident is actually because you are really a boy or you're really a For sure. People are going to do this. They're going to do it in religion. They're going to do it in culture. They're going to do it in everything. You're really looking for something. What you're looking for is Christ. The reason you feel empty inside, guys, the reason all of you feel empty inside is because you haven't filled that hole with Jesus Christ. Let Jesus Christ fill that hole. Let him fill you up to such a point where you are in ecstasy at the connection you have with him. You feel unhappy. You are depressed. You need a therapist because the hole you're trying to fill with that therapist is actually Jesus Christ. It's true. You need Jesus. That's what it is. Okay? Bro, with that said, I appreciate that we watched this, but I came across that story and I thought it was interesting. Peace and love to Allie Beth and peace and love to these parents. But bro, you are not helping yourself. And I, you know, they can't help it. They can't help but not help themselves. Because it, it literally, it just, you know, when you, this is why people have a hard time popping a bubble. Because once you have a belief about the world, and if you pop that bubble and you have to redo your whole life, it's too much work. People don't face themselves in small and big ways every day. Whatever Leo ends up being, whether he's a boy or a girl or a they or a them or whatever, I want him to find his joy more than anything else. Same with this, this family. Regardless of if they're Christian or transphobes, I want them to find their joy. That's what I would like for them. And I think we all need to accept that Leo and his parents are not going to look the same being joyful. They're going to have different versions of joy. We can have a convo if you guys want to do call-ins real fast. Hello. Can you hear me? Hi, How are you? I'm great. How are you? Good. I thought this would be a, a good video to call in about. <laughs> yes, I'm stoked now. <laughs> oh my gosh. Well, I already know what you're going to say, but why don't you tell the audience like who you are in terms of like this subject matter and, and why you called in? Yeah. So this is Colleen. I think the chat's probably familiar with me. Mm -hmm. So I'm calling in because um, I actually have a child who came to us a couple years ago and told us that they thought that they were trans and mm -hmm. it really at the time I, I just I wasn't expecting it um we always we never really pushed gender stereotypes or anything like that we tried to be very flexible you know and teach our kids no such thing as boy things girl things all of that mm -hmm. um so and, and our kid didn't really ever, they were just a normal, like they were never always gravitating towards the opposite or anything like that. Mm -hmm. You know, they liked plenty of girl things. My daughter was born as a female. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they, they liked all things. So I just, we weren't expecting it basically. Um, and I've always been more on the left mm -hmm. and, um, you know, I don't, I never really been around trans kids or anything, but I was familiar with the concept, um, especially over the past 
few years, it's definitely become talked about more. Um, and, and in those cases, I was seeing kids that were from a very young age, mm. you know, and so it, it just kind of surprised us. Um, but with that said, you know, I think the first thing I asked was, would you like us to call you different pronouns? Mm. And my child said, no, not oh, yet. <laughs> interesting. So it was um, definitely a bubble pop moment for me mm -hmm. because I didn't know what to do with that. Yeah. I really didn't. I didn't see it coming. And my child was not prepared to even have parent. You know, a kid just wasn't ready for that. Yeah. So, you know, a time passed and, and my kid didn't bring it up again for a while. And I kind of, you know, we didn't want to make a big deal about it kind of see what happened. And over time, maybe a year later, it became apparent that, you know, this is still something my child very much feels, um, you know, and, and the older they get, they still feel this way. And mm. so it's really, it caused me to really explore a lot of different bubbles to take in a lot of different information. Yeah. Yeah. A I'm lot of information that was not helpful. <laughs> mm, oh, I believe that. Now, I'm sorry. Did I miss it? Did you say how old your child is, if you don't mind sharing? My child's 13 right now. 13. Okay, perfect. So basically the same age group that we're talking about with Leo's story. Okay, that makes a lot of yes. sense. Okay, so what was yes. that like then researching and how did you decipher what was good information and what was bad information? Well, I came to the conclusion that anything that would cause my child more suffering is bad information. Mm, love that. And that's really kind of how I distinguish it. Mm. Um, because I refuse to do that. Yeah. But because what I'm hearing my child tell me is I'm suffering and I think I found a solution to my suffering. Ooh. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't really matter um, whether at this point, whether I think that that's accurate or not, mm -hmm. kind of irrelevant. Cause that's for my kid to figure out. Mm. So we just started asking a lot of questions and having a lot of really difficult conversations that was hard for my kid even yeah. about why you feel this way, how you came to this conclusion. What does this look like for you? You know, we, we, we've started to really dig deep, you know, and in, into it. Um, and then by understanding these things, it's helping us to actually figure out which tools to supply our child with mm -hmm. that would actually be helpful. And clearly therapy, awesome. Yeah. Therapy's great, but we all know finding a good therapist is challenging. It is hard. But it's essential. Yes, I agree. But it's deeper than that. Mm -hmm. Just like we talk about for us, that beyond the therapy, that there is a spiritual, that there is a philosophical element to these things. We have to teach our children that too. Mm -hmm. We have to guide them on that journey. We don't get to tell them what that looks like, though. You know, I think... It's, I don't get to tell my kids that the same journey I had is the one that's necessarily right for them. Here's a question. So it's just, yeah. If you don't mind. Um, as a parent, yeah. I think there are bubbles in which you think or feel obligated to taking on the burden of solving your parents or your child's problems. But yes, it doesn't sound absolutely. like that might be the healthiest way for parents to go about things because then they might – make a mistake for their child. So how do you personally balance not getting in your child's way while also not being the reason your child doesn't excel, you know, like by not doing enough? You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so one thing we've done is to teach our child to bubble hop. Oh, nice. Um, to, to understand, you know, to really see the different bubbles and – what types of people are in them mm -hmm. and allow them to safely 
explore the things that they need to explore Mm -hmm. in the right bubbles with the right people where it's safe and comfortable. How do they receive that state? Oh, okay. I would not. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I would not, I'm just not going to throw my kids at the wolves and, um, you know, I'm not, I'm not forcing them in one way or the other, Mm -hmm. you know, or pushing them. How did your kid react to the bubble popping tool? Like, did they understand it? Was it a weird idea? Did they like it? Did it help them? They actually really loved it. Cool. And they've, they've done really well with it. I think that they very much understand that they want to feel safe. They really, truly, they want to feel safe and comfortable. Yeah. Um, so desperately. And, you know, about a year ago, we actually pulled her out of public school and mm. started homeschooling. Not because they were, not because, not with the conservatives think, because they were teaching her this at school or something. And by the way, we use, we use all different pronouns for sure. my child. Sure. At this point. Okay. So... It wasn't that like this wasn't coming. This wasn't being taught in school or anything. We pulled our kid out because our child was being relentlessly bullied Mm. by the parents that think that and teach their children that really look at that. The irony. And that's just (sighs) really sad. It is so So, sad. Yeah. Um, you know, so it's just, we've tried to gently guide our kid but not Mm -hmm. even in one direction just towards inner peace yeah I was gonna ask if you guys had a goal I I was gonna ask if you guys had like a hopeful outcome internally like oh I hope this is the outcome yeah inner peace I think which is such a complicated thing you know and I tell I tell my kids like you know I'm in my late 30s and it's Mm. not even till like you know, in my thirties that yeah. I've, I felt comfortable in my own body. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, it's a challenge. It's definitely a challenge, but it's their journey to decide what that looks like for them. Absolutely. Now, can I ask, um, how many siblings are there? Like how many kids total do you have? Two. Okay. And okay. so this is our youngest. Okay. And interestingly enough, and I'm going to sound crazy right now. It's so crazy. Okay. Because my oldest is 17. And even within the past week, my oldest has come to me and expressed the same struggle. Mm, Yeah. And what do you say? You can't, you can't do that because your siblings already doing. No. Yeah. Yeah. My child's saying I'm suffering, mom. I'm suffering. Help me. Yeah, it's so interesting. We're starting on the same journey. You know? Yeah. I mean, what else are you going to do? So I think like, okay, what I'm fascinated by, I think is this idea that our relationship with like gender or sexuality or any of those things are going to be sort of binary. Like they're going to be like you either are or you aren't. And I think that could be true for lots of people. But I'm always going to be interested in the people that like fluctuate or what if there's like a, like what are the chances that like I was thinking about baby boomers and how if um, so many of their habits contribute to the higher chances of having neurodivergent chi- children that what are the chances mm-hmm. that we're all, not all like neurodivergent to some extent or there's some prevalence in the like just population and same with our children like what are the chances that all of my mom's 10 kids would be straight probably pretty low actually especially considering how many sons she had because they've done some studies about the prevalence of mothers having sons and how if there's too many boys in the gene pool that it's more likely one of them's to be gay. And I think that's kind of interesting, right? But then those studies don't sound good to some people. And maybe they're wrong. Who knows? But I think like, I don't know. Is there like, what are the chances both your kids are trans? Well, what are the chances that they're both cis? I think I would love to know that. Like, what are the chances? I just don't think we have the data. Yeah. And I don't, I think it's so much more complicated than that. Mm. I think, you know, this, this has definitely, um, this, this time period, the last couple of years, mm-hmm. we've really started to understand neurodivergence better mm-hmm. to identify. It. And I definitely think there's an element of that going on. We're seeking diagnoses right now. Mm-hmm. Um, only to, only as a tool 
mm. for them to better understand themselves. Yeah. Um, and I do think, yeah, I think there is that neurodivergent people often are a little more fluid in a lot of ways. Yeah, I think so too. You know? I do. And I do often tell them like, it's okay to, it's being, being queer is fine. Like express yourself how you, you know, it's, it's okay. I think I don't, I mean, if I'm being completely honest, I don't love the idea of medical transition because sure. it sounds very hard and difficult. Mm. Mm -hmm. If that is where they end up, then I support that. Yeah. But I don't want them to make that decision hastily. Sure. I agree. Um, and I certainly don't want to push them away. You know, I think the thing is with some of these parents is they often forget what it was like to be a teenager, mm -hmm. you know, and how, when their parents didn't like something, they rebelled. And sometimes later in life, you can say, damn, my parents were right. But not always. Yeah. Some people never, it, it never comes to that. You know, you I'll know, tell you this. My, I'm sorry. I don't mean to interrupt you. Finish your thought. No, I'm you're sorry. good. Are no, you sure? You're good. Okay. Yeah. I was going to say, I, um, I, every day I wake up and I'm like, oh my God, I'm turning into my mother. Only yes. I'm like the progressive version of my mother, but like without a doubt. <laughs> and honestly, I kind of say it with like a twinge of pride because I see the goodness in my parents and I see how they were rebellious with their parents and still love them when we're there when they died. And I see that with my parents, how like I'm going to be rebellious, but also I love them and I appreciate that they tried to give me this like bubble that they thought was going to be so good for me. And I want to take that wisdom and give like, you know, my partner and I that, but like a bubble of our own to feel good in. And ultimately that's what the tool they gave me was, was like pick yourself, pick your life, pick your marriage and do what you think will bring you joy. Even if like we had different ideas of what that would look like, you know, but I, I really am seeing a lot of my life, like I'm seeing my parents and myself a lot and I'm honestly pretty happy about it because minus the like the difference in values are our, our difference in like queer values, our general values are the same. Like be kind to people, do good by your community, treat people with dignity. We just differ on how, you know what I mean? Yeah, oh, very, very relatable. I grew up in a Christian home and it's, very yeah definitely the older I get I I've even you know my dad didn't go to church when I was little he hmm. started going when I was a teenager my mom always went but my dad really got he he became very very um, active in the church mm -hmm. when me and my siblings were teenagers and now that I have teenagers I laugh and I joke with my parents that I understand why mm. um, <laughs> Because I think, although my dad always identified as a Christian, I think it's like something about, you know, your children getting to an age of just, you know, rebelling. And it's yeah. like he, he, he realized he was losing control mm. and he turned to the church to feel better about it. And I get that, you know, it's like, yeah. I don't want to control the outcome, but God, I don't want my kids to suffer. Mm. And, you know, it's um, anything that is within my control. Like, what what tools can I find? What knowledge can I give them? Um, you know, I think, and I think, you know, my parents were the same way. Yeah. They were doing it a little different, but they were seeking answers too. Yes, absolutely. And they just wanted the best. And I can't fault them for that. And, you know, it wasn't always fun especially um when my sister came out that was oh a horrible time wait um so you got a queer sister yes my older sister's queer so girl, when she came out the lgbt was, in your genetics girl no and i'm bi so oh I mean, girl yeah, it's definitely my <laughs> genetics it's just yeah it's like hello hilarious you know? and also i'm so grateful to have to be married to someone that is within reason of all of this. Do you mm. know how awful it mm. would be if my spouse was, you know, on either way, if my, my spouse was like, we, we have to medically transition. I would be like, no, yeah. no, no, slow down. Or if my husband was like, that doesn't believe in this or, you mm. know, I would be bothered. Yeah. You know, I think my, we're often very much on the same page. My husband sees them as unique consciousness and that these are 
real people with real feelings. Yeah. And it's, he just, he wants to love them. Like, it's so complicated when people think they're guiding someone in the right direction, but causing them pain. Yeah. It's, it's challenging. And I'm just, I'm glad that we've stayed on the same page. You know, and I didn't know that when we got married, mm -hmm. like, We've been married 15 years. Like Congrats. no one was talking about trans kids. Thanks. Yeah. Um, yeah. That wasn't a conversation then. Mm -hmm. And he's very, he's pretty apolitical. Sure. So, you know, I, it's not like that was a question I even thought to ask, but the conversations we did have were more about, you know, you know, do you accept gay people? All of those conversations and more of like how he really looked at it. Like, mm. do you have gay friends? And that was a big one. Yeah. Like he did have gay friends, gay male friends. It's just, it says something about someone's character. It's, you know, I knew he was going to, I knew he wasn't going to be an extremist, I guess, in that, in those kinds of ways. Yeah. Um, and I think that's, you know, important to have somebody that's on the same page as you. Absolutely. And maybe you don't always know the exact specific questions, but mm. you can see someone's character. You know, someone's character. Yeah. Yeah, you know I believe that. They're in, essentially, you know? Yes, I do agree. You have to, like, I do think it's hard because I mean, that's a common question I get in chat all the time is like, how do you know? But so much of it comes from like knowing yourself and where you would be and then where other people would be against. Like, so much of what we learn about ourselves is by observing others and then relating it back to our own knowledge and then expanding on that. And I think people just look outward or just look inward and they forget like it's a symbiotic relationship between exchanging of information. Yeah. I'm curious. Um, your 17 year old, were they nervous to tell you? You know, I think so. I think so. I think, um, I think they, and I'm, I'm probably going to say he more with, because this is so new for me sure. and it, it's things like practice. I'm not trying to, um, but yeah, I think so. I think that maybe part of that was like, knowing a sibling, I, you know, I think, I, I don't know. I think clearly there was some kind of stress about it, you mm -hmm. know, about, um, you know, I'm not, I don't know. It yeah. is interesting. I do wonder, I think it is something that we're definitely going to explore. You know, we talked about the other day, I was like, look, if there's like resentment and anger built up towards us, like we have to talk about it. Like yeah. if there is a reason you withheld this, we have to talk about it. And I know that's uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and if the reality is my oldest is just not much of a talker anyway. Yeah. So, and kind of keeps things to themselves um, a lot. So I don't know if maybe that was part of it, mm. but you know, we're at the beginning of this journey. I think there is a lot to unpack. Definitely. Yeah. But I do clearly think that there was some reservation or it would have happened sooner. Interesting. That is interesting that the younger came out first. But I also think like that sometimes, you know, you just don't even know when is the right time to have that conversation. I don't, especially as a teenager, it's such a, like a weird phenomenon of knowing like, when is this the time? I just remember for myself, like it was such a big deal coming out. And again, it seems so less important now, but it was so big then. It was so, so big and they made it big. Like the adults around me made it a big thing. And that was what yeah. was so frustrating is like, I could have made this a small thing, but you made it so big. Now it's big, whether I like it or not. And I think that that says so much about the environment we are raised in, where as much as kids are doing things um, in big ways, not all teenagers want a big thing. And so I yeah, think like no, building a true. space, you know, where they could come out the way and that I, makes sense for them makes sense. Yeah, go ahead. For sure. I do wonder if, um, I do think that clearly with our child that was born female, mm. had this realization at a fairly young age, um, probably they're 13 now. So it was probably like 10 or 11. Um, and I think that there's probably going to be easier for a 10 or 11 year old female to present in a more masculine way than 
for a 15, 16, 17 year old mm. male child to mm-hmm. present in a more feminine way. Yeah. And I, I, I really wonder if that is part of it. Yeah. I could um, definitely see that. And, he, you know, there's been times over like the past year where he's asked me like, you know, to do makeup or things here and there. And there's a lot of frustration around these things. And, mm-hmm. and I can tell that it's like, my child's very curious. They, because here's the thing, I guess transitioning is a solution to a problem. Mm-hmm. All right. It's so I, you know, I've just, I've seen this struggle. I didn't know exactly what it was until recently because I'm not going to assume anything, but I have seen the struggle of, you know, clearly wanting to experiment and explore things, but not knowing how and Mm -hmm. not knowing if it's always a safe or comfortable place to do that, Mm -hmm. especially where we live, Mm -hmm. you know, so. I was going to say being in a conservative state, I wonder if it was harder for your older child. I think so. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. My youngest had a couple trans friends when they were Mm. in school. So as much as they were being bullied, they did have a couple friends that understood them and in that way. Um, and I don't, my oldest does not. Okay. That so makes I think sense. there's some, you know, some elements there of, and, you know, I think as, as parents, you know, we, oh geez, you know, like I said, we're just all about what can we do to help? Yeah. So within the past year, we've, we're trying desperately to move to another state. Really? Which has that's a big a deal. Challenges. Yeah, it's a huge it deal. I think it'll be best for them, you know, and that's what our, our jobs to just do what's best for them. Interesting. Now, okay. This is the weirdest question that sort of doesn't relate, but relates since you are a mom on the internet and you're watching a streamer, do your kids think you're cool or are we the lame part of the internet? <laughs> um, <laughs> My kids, my my son even said this like Sunday morning, we were making breakfast together. And he said, I hate it that you're cool. I really do. <laughs> so I don't know if that answers your question, but that was out of his mouth. And I laughed and I said, I get it. I hated that my dad was cool when I was a teenager too. But I That's can't hilarious. help it. My dad is kind of cool, you know? Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Even though my dad is, you know, more conservative than me. Yeah. I can admit he's still a cool guy. But I, yeah, I think my kids, you know, I don't, yeah. That's cute. They, I think they have an understanding. They appreciate that I know as much as I do. Yeah. Okay. This they is this is that. this is what I think I would want to know, and this is what I think. Not that my channel will ever be seen by these kinds of parents, but if you could talk to conservative parents about their concerns, how do you think there is a bridge there? Like, what is the missing conversation that we're not having with these parents to get them to understand? Like why their kids are struggling in the way that they are. Like, did you watch the news story we just watched about Leo? Yes. Okay. Like, what would you tell those parents? It's such a challenge with that because because <laughs> they are trapped in a bubble. Yeah. But I would advise them to understand their child is experiencing human suffering, Mm. something we all experience at one time or another, and that you have the opportunity to help your child through that suffering, or you can contribute to more of it. Mm. And I would highly encourage them to not be part of the suffering because the world is going to give them plenty of that. Oh, girl, let me tell you. They don't need it from us. They mm-hmm. really don't. They need us. They need a safe place to figure these things out. And maybe they don't end up where you want them to be. But at least, at, at least you you're not contributing to more trauma. Mm. Absolutely, these kids are really suffering. I mean, these kids. These children are suffering and you have to have compassion for them. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And it's challenging because, you know, when you're talking to someone who thinks that, you know, all suffering can be relieved through 
Jesus Christ, it's like not maybe not for everyone. Right. And maybe and maybe down the road your kid does come back to that. Maybe. But telling them that they don't even know themselves mm. is not gonna get them there. No, ma'am. No, ma'am. That's to this day. That is probably one of the most like triggering sentences that my that my parents say is like, I know you better than you know yourself. I'm like, that's really difficult to process as like appropriate when you're in your mid thirties. <laughs> yeah. But also yeah. I understand like what you're trying to like I translate. I always like after therapy, I learned how to translate what people were saying, I think, which did contribute obviously to me realizing like people are in bubbles. And then I was like co like using therapy and philosophy together. And it made me realize, like, okay, if I can translate for my parents, could I translate for the world? And obviously, yes, because everyone is saying something, but meaning, even me, I wish people would watch me and then try to translate what I'm saying because I'm not saying, I'm not always saying what you think I'm saying. And so it's like, okay, what is she trying to say? Which is why, you know, so hearing that, like, I know you better than I know yourself, I, I wonder if it coincides with what you said earlier about, like, your dad going back to church because he was losing control. And I wonder if it's, like, their way of saying, like, no, I know. I know my daughter. Like, when you – kind of like when you're in a marriage and you're like, do I even know my partner? I wonder if parents feel something similar where it's like, do I even know my own kids? You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, I think it – yeah. I think it is – it's a challenge. It yeah. is. And, you know, I said it earlier in the chat – Um you know, I think it's sometimes with these things, it's like parents feel like a failure within their bubble. Yeah. Yeah. However, what they don't realize is the kid felt like a failure already. They felt like a failure, mm. which is why they went to look for another one in the first place. Amen. A freaking men. That, so that is, you know, yeah. you feel like a failure as a parent. Your kid does too. That, okay, that's the oh. that's the thing is like I really want to like pe pe for people to really process that our parents raise us in a way, generally speaking, where they think like I'm giving my kid the world and what they're giving you is like a world that they like and they're comfortable in. And then it's that like realization of like my kid, why aren't my kids comfortable in this? Like I gave them a really good upbringing. And it's like, well, you know, you didn't foresee that your kid would be this type of child. And that's why I say, like, I really do think my parents did one thing pretty good, which was, like, they all kind of treated us differently in in a good way, meaning, like, if they noticed that one kid was better off here, they put them there. If one kid needed more help here, they focused. No, it wasn't perfect. Two parents and ten kids. Trust me, the middle kids got neglected and the younger kids raised themselves and the older kids got the worst of it, you know? But yeah. they did their best. And for humans, like – gold star in terms of like perfect parenting I mean is there even such a thing you know you know though by my chat standards you are an amazing mother they are really loving you right now girl thank you it hasn't been easy and like yeah there's definitely times where you know I I've made mistakes or it's just you know there's times where it's just been overwhelming about how to best help my kids yeah because nobody's Nobody's having this conversation in a real way, Brittany. Yeah. This is so over-politicized. Oof, girl. Even mm. therapists are online arguing about this shit. Oh, you're telling me. I'm so telling you. Mm -hmm. If therapists are arguing about it, like, hello, these kids are fucking suffering, guys. Mm -hmm. Get it together. Yeah. Well, they. I really agree with this, and I think this is the hardest part is – I, like no matter what, like professionals are people and people are biased. And so they're all going to like become sort of like talking points even. And that's why I think medicine does suffer or the world suffers because we cannot escape our own bias and prejudice or our own vanity or our ego or anything else. And so like people do suffer. And like that's why I'm like, let's just suffer less. But that's it's 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 asking a lot of people. But I, I hope that we continue asking it of people if we ask anything is to like mitigate suffering. Yeah, and I think your approach is really is good because, you know, we st people talk about these things on such a big mm. level as if um, trans people are monoliths, that this trans kids are, you know, like as if this is the same experience. It's just not. It's yeah. not. And I just highly recommend people to talk to in to the individual. Mm. The world is not going to answer for your children. Right. Right. 
that's you know no I agree with that you're you know it's so much more complicated than that so much more your kid needs very every kid needs different things and that like you you know that is how we try to do it every you know our oldest still goes to public school Mm. because up until this point he's thrived Mm -hmm. you know so you know it's it's complicated you know just because we pulled one out doesn't necessarily you know yeah one something different than the other plus our oldest one he's he actually really he's really enjoyed public school up until this point Um, yeah you know I think that's the key though is like one thing bullied oh it's just because one's being bullied doesn't mean the other one is can you hear me girl you're cutting out just a bit I just want to make sure we can hear each other sorry yeah, sorry. Okay, no problem. So you were saying like just because one got bullied doesn't mean the other one isn't going to enjoy their their time in public school. Is that what you were saying? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yep. yeah, yeah. Well, I think um, as parents, it must be incredibly difficult because, you know, I'll hear these stories about parents where they – they genuinely, and I totally understand it, are so busy working, they don't have time to be parents, are so busy worrying about other parts of life that they forget that parenting isn't just like feeding and clothing and sheltering your kid. It is being present in their growth as a, like a consciousness. And I think that that's probably probably a big part of it. I don't think that's a modern problem, by the way. I think like, I think about how my ancestors must have parented and I'm thinking, well, if you were working every day in the fields, you know, vineyard, doing vineyard stuff, like when were you ever with the kids? And they're like, oh, like I grew up understanding that the kids were kind of doing their own thing. So I I think that humans are still in this like evolutionary process of socializing differently and paying more attention to the individual consciousness that their kids are. And that that's something that I think we are getting closer to and I like a better, but we're still in the, the process of it. Like you are an ideal sort of like hope, right? Like you're going to pay attention to your kids, treat them as individuals and do your best to help them. But like you yeah, are the I, exception right now. Well, I think it's a fairly new concept. For sure. To give a shit about children's feelings. Yeah. Honestly. Yeah. You know, I, I think it's actually, I mean, who knows? I mean, maybe there were some ancient civilizations doing things differently, but as far as what I understand yeah. in our modern history, nobody gave a shit about kids' feelings. Yeah. And I hear, I, I hear mean, stories every day about people who grew up in houses where like kids, they don't care how kids feel. That's really hard for me because like I definitely think like I think growing up we were allowed to say our feelings, but obviously we were pushed in a direction about our feelings, which also sucked. But yeah, like – I think you're right on that. Yeah, I mean, I know, you know, even with my parents, you know, it's like as messy and complicated as it was, like they really did, they did do a better job than their parents because mm-hmm. they were getting beaten daily by their parents. So it, it was an improvement, right? you know, and I, <laughs> yeah. like, no, like they really yeah, you know, they were part of that generation where, like, their feelings as children really did not matter at all. Absolutely. And so, you know, yeah, what they gave us was definitely better than that. Isn't, and, you know, that is, yeah, we just try to do better with each generation. Now, uh, hopefully. I wonder if everyone's raised with that mentality because even as I said that on stream, I was like, oh, wait, is this like my bubble? Like saying you want to do better than your parents? Like, is that my bubble? Like, or is that a uni- – like, is that sort of – I want to know, is that universal for people? It sounds like you were sort of raised with that mentality as well. Yeah, for sure. I think, uh, you know, I think it's – it's. I think it's a pretty common narrative, mm. although clearly it's not the case for all families. Yeah. I think there's definitely people that are very comfortable in the bubble they're born in. Mm. And those people are less likely to even feel the need to try to do something differently mm-hmm. because they think it worked. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I think with with those people, it is going to be a little different. But I do think it is pretty common to want to do par- better than your parents did. Yeah, I would hope and so. I, th- mm-hmm. I think a lot of times, though, people think that more financially – and they kind of um, don't always recognize the emotional needs. Mm. Like, you know, I think it's very common for people who grew up in poverty to say, I'm going to do better than my parents. 
because being poor sucks. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, but the emotional part, you know, maybe, maybe not quite as common as that piece. I agree. I agree with that. Yeah. I think it's easier to set your sights on something physical and tangible and much harder to think about having a different relationship with something that's like so internal and invisible, except when, you know, cause so many people are so good at suppressing their feelings and suppressing their needs and suppressing to, you know what I mean? Go for the tangible that I could see a reality where that is sort of like, um, a distractor almost, which is why I think when people seek out material, it doesn't end up filling that hole because that hole is like within. It's from like your childhood, your life, like your consciousness. Um, but even growing up, I would hear stories from my parents saying like, oh, you should have seen the way your grandparents treated me. And like, oh, my grandparents would tell me stories like, oh, I used to do this to your dad and this to your mom. And we would just think this was normal. And now they don't even do that anymore. And I'm like, yeah. Yeah. Do you guys think that made like no impact? And like, they're like, well, everyone's fine now because they figured it out. But like, that is kind of like, I'm like, but do you think it made no impact? Because like, I still obviously believe in that impact. I see it in myself. I see it in my parents' parenting. As much as we all came out okay and good enough, obviously, when it comes to breaking generational curses or changing a trajectory for your family, like, it's obviously work for the kids. It's so interesting. Like, the burden falls on the children, whether the parents like it or not. Yeah, it, it, it does, unfortunately. Yeah, it does. I think I think that that, um, you know, I don't know if it's always intentional. Yeah, of um, course, yeah. That, that people focus more, you know, so much on the physical. I think sometimes it's just survival. You're mm. so caught up in a survival state. You're not thinking about that other piece. Absolutely. You know? Yeah. Um, it's a challenge to, you know, it, it can be a challenge to think about that when in, in survival mode, for sure. Yeah, I agree. Um, you know, and it's work. It's work. I think that's another thing, too, is like, <laughs> these things take a lot of effort, and mm -hmm. it's very uncomfortable. I think some, a lot of people are uncomfortable with some very vulnerable conversations, um, because it's not, not easy, especially with your kids, mm. because you're likely to hear things you don't want to hear. Yep. Yep. Um, and it's, you know, I think, you know, it's, it's challenging to, it's challenging for people to not be so defensive, you know, to not try to justify these things to their children when their kids point them out. It's complicated. Yeah. You know? People are often very, you know, wrapped up in, in their way of thinking when your child presents you with something that's different. It's, it's, it's hard to understand and to, you know, not justify it in the way you understand things. It's, it's hard. Well, I think I, from my understanding of how some adults seem to present themselves, um, even some of the most introspective ones I know, sometimes I think they get to like a certain age or understanding of the world, and they genuinely think like, okay, like I, I'm not gonna learn anything new from people that I don't think can teach me things. And I think that that's probably a pretty f common thought process for a lot of people. But I would say like that is what, for me, is kind of what I'm looking at in people, because I feel like everyone can teach me something. But then I feel like that's part of my open-mindedness and curiosity. And I will say, like, it's interesting to see sometimes the way my parents react. Like, my dad will sometimes say, like, do you think I'm stupid? And I'm like, no. Why do you think I think that? And he was like, because you're talking to me. Like, I don't know things. I was like, well, you just said this thing out loud. And so I'm just asking you why you think that. And he was just like, well, why do you think what you think? And I was like, well, this is why. Why do you think that? And he goes, well, this is why. And then we look at each other. But the whys we're given is so subjective that I'm like, can we find the objective in this why? And then no, because it's coming from us, but he feels like he has the connection to the objective and I'm pretty sure it's subjective. And that alone is going to cause a rift and what openness he'll have that I could ever give him a tool is because I'm never going yeah. to present my ideas like they're objective. And he, like many people, think they have access to the objective and that they're coming from an objective place. And so that's automatically going to frustrate people. It's what I've seen people frustrated with me in general in this space is they're like, what's objective? I was like, um, I wish I knew. 
you know? Right. But I don't know. And I'm just doing what I think is best. But that's the problem is like people don't want it. They would rather me grift the fuck out of content and say, I know what's objective. They would feel, I think I would be more popular if I did that. I do. I think people would feel, I feel like they would trust me more (laughs) because I said, I know, even if I don't. Yeah. 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 You know, it's like, I have these conversations with my dad too, of, you know, at Christmas, he was saying, he was saying something about men carrying purses. Mm. It's going to like be the downfall of society or something. I'm like, what are you talking about right now? You know, <laughs> like what, where does that I even love come that. from? You know, and so, I love that. You know, I just start dropping information about how these things are just, it's, it's all perception. These things change yeah. over time. Yeah. What we associate, you know, it's like, and I start giving examples and he sits there and he's like, thinks about it. And he's like, I think I said something about, you know, pink being a boy color you know yep um yep. Mm-hmm. and then he's like thinks about it he's like is that true I'm like why would i say it if it's not true <laughs> these things change and then you know but i do mm-hmm. drop in there i'm like it, you know yeah these things change but we can all recognize that when you're in a society when you do things outside of the norm then yes yeah. some people are going to have judgment Mm-hmm. Like mm-hmm. I can acknowledge that. Of course. But I cannot acknowledge this in the factual way you're presenting this as mm-hmm. if a guy who has a bag is going to hurt someone. Like, who gives a shit? Who gives a shit? No, you know? exactly. <laughs> I think that's like ultimately, obviously what we're doing here on this channel, but in our lives is like we're all going home and saying like, how can I build this bridge or how can I make this connection, which you don't have to do. But I do think it's interesting that we wanted our parents to do it for us, but we won't do it for them. But then I think it is within reason. Like I think about this all the time, how I love my parents, but I'm not going to change the way I decorate my house so they can come visit. But it is something that I'm not willing to do for them anymore that I was willing to do when I was single, of course. But like they won't do it for me. If I come to their home, it's not like they're going to change. You know what I mean? So it's like, why are we pushing? So There is like a a timeline in your childhood to adulthood in which it's not about age, but it's about like the time you are in your life in which I have now decided to make my own home with my own partner and my own family. And so now it is like the time where I'm like, I am no longer the single daughter that like was willing to make concessions. I am the married woman who's now saying like with peace and love, this is my home and now it won't change for anybody. And I think like that line in the sand while still saying I love you unconditionally is so hard to get to because you would think it looks like us both accepting our different homes and changing for each other. But I think it's about recognizing in which in which ways this is the relationship and this is good enough. Yeah, no, definitely. And I will say the more grace I've given my parents, the more grace they've given me. Mm, 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 mm. I love that. And... uh, would I like more? Maybe, probably, you know, like, sure. is there more? Of course, I would, I would love that, sure. but I don't expect it. Um, and I spent way too much time in therapy, like working through this shit to be caught up on some bullshit now. Yeah. yeah. You know, like I, I just, I love my parents deeply, but I don't have this need for them to see me. Mm. Or fully understand me mm-hmm. because I'm a grown woman. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm over it. Like I've, I've myself, the things I need and I have other people in my life that, you know, I don't, I don't need that from them, but yeah. the more grace I give them, the more they give me, you know, the more I, I speak to them in a way that makes sense for them, Yeah, the more they acknowledge mm-hmm. my differences and in a way that's not so combative. I agree. Right. Yep. Yep. That's my lived experience. Well, I, think... all I, I don't want to. Mm-hmm. I don't want to argue with these people forever. Right. Right. I really don't. Nope. I don't want to argue with anyone forever, girl. Not even my audience. Like with yeah. peace and love. But obviously, like 
and I see it in myself. I, I always think the comment section is a great opportunity for me to like build a bridge, you know, in the same way that I do when I go home and do it and vice versa. Like the tools I learned from building bridges with my family, I take to the internet. The, the tools I learned about building bridges on the internet, I take to my family. Like the whole point is like, I already see that the world is in conflict. I'm really trying not to add to it, you know, even with my attitude, but ultimately we naturally add to it by just existing. Yeah. You know? And for sure. And like, I mean, you know, I, I've even started to, you know, read books and things that are helpful to me that are maybe even a little more conservative mm. so that if I think it is a good tool, then I will then recommend it to my, you know, parents or my brother or, you know, somebody in my life that is more conservative. Mm -hmm. Like recently I read, um, or I did the audio book of Dr. John Deloney, yeah. A Non-Anxious Life. Yeah. And it was really good. It, I mean, he is a conservative at the end. He does tell you to go to church, but nah. aside from that, it was actually really, really, he really says, you know, some of the things that, um, about facing yourself. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, and, and so I thought that was a really good one. I sent that to my, you hey, know, my conservatives need therapy because, too, you know, and they need to hear from people that get them. Do. Yes. Yeah, they do. They do. So it's like, you know, sure. I, oh, sure. I'm putting in, I think a lot of people don't want to do the emotional labor for someone else. And that's what it feels like. Oh yeah. But I'm gaining things out of this too. Good. That's I, what we I, look I forward to. I from it. I gain tools from it. Yes. And it's building a bridge. I try not to do you anything. Know, like I tried to have, I think that's why having strong boundaries is kind of key. And by the way, like even from the labor you're doing for your kids, like I'm sure there's a shift for you as a parent and for you, you know, for your brain and your emotional labor, like even with our kids, with our parents, with everybody, even with our own spouses, I would just like everyone to have an opportunity to like recharge spoons and to have boundaries and to say like, oh, I think this is like the best we can do today and then pick it up tomorrow. You know what I mean? For sure. For sure. I think that is a big part of it. It's knowing when to, to step away, to yeah. take a break, to yeah, set those boundaries to say, I love you guys, but I can't do this right now. Right. I, I need some space. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. You know, and that's, that's, you know, part of all of it is, especially when building bridges with family and parents is boundaries. Mm. You know, that's, that, that was a, the boundaries was the most complicated thing to develop with my mother because she really struggled to understand it for a long time. I mean, she didn't talk to me for a year at one point because yep. I asked her to call before she showed up at my house. Oh, yeah. So oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. I can see that. Mm -hmm. I get it. I get it. There's That's okay. But like what a beautiful like blessing your mother has you in her life because I do think and I always joke with my parents. It's like you hate therapy, but because I went to therapy, this family has more peace. This yeah. family has more peace. And I know because I'm the sister who like brings you guys the tools and I'm the daughter who brings you the tools. So as much as they want to talk shit, like it absolutely has made a difference, like having those hard conversations and me knowing it would be hard and me not accepting everything to be solved in a day was a tool I learned from therapy. So I could say, okay, it might take my parents a year, two years, five years, 10 years. But the point is, is that like, I'm not here to do more than I can do. And I'm here to have boundaries. Like, absolutely. You know? Yep. And then, and your parents recognize it and they see it and they do, you see the subtle changes in them. Absolutely. You, because of it. Oh my God. Without they a doubt. They see the difference in you. They see the difference in you. So therefore. True. They, those little seeds. Absolutely. They, you know, they, they start to grow, you know, it, it, it mm. it's time. It takes time though. It takes it does. time and it takes effort. But I agree with you. I think they do. They see it in you first. Like really, really like walking the walk matters. Like it matters to the right people because they're not going to believe you if you're still like going off and create. Like I was so unhinged in my 20s sometimes. And my parents saw so much of that because they were obviously the emotional trigger for me. But now that they've seen me be so much better during those arguments, like or during those disagreements. Oh my gosh. They're like, wait, why are you calm right now? Wait, why aren't you mad at us? Wait. Why aren't you like cutting us off? And I'm like, nope, I know what's happening this time. Like I know what to do. <laughs> but like that makes a huge difference. And it's such good news. Like everything, everyone's waiting, you know, even with like me getting married so quickly. Of course, everyone like looked and was like, what's happening? And they're like, OK, she's good. But even they had a right to be concerned considering the boyfriends I've brought home, girl. But like I get it. You know what I mean? Yeah. And it's 
it's it's still a gift we give each other, which is to like allow for change to occur. For sure. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. All right, girly. Is there anything else on your noggin today? I think that was it. Okay. Thank you for calling in. That was really great. Of course. Okay. Thanks Enjoy your day. Okay. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye. Stuck in my head in real life while I'm dead. My belly's being fed and I'm okay. I'm just fine. Yet all I do is whine. Not to you in my mind. Cause I know I don't make sense. I've been nothing but blessed. So why's my life a mess? Please tell me cause I'm sick of thinking. Yeah, I'm sick of reaching out for the truth And living life as a fool Dun, da, da, da.